Words of the Heart by Yorondesa Makrina Vasupulu, 1921-1995 I do not have eloquent speech, but these humble words that I say to you, I say from my heart. Signed Yorondesa Makrina. Published by the Holy Monastery of St. John the Forerunner in Goldendale, Washington. Forward to the English edition by Metropolitan Herotheus of Nafpaktos. I read the book of the homilies of Yoronda Samakrina, Rasupulu, Words of the Heart, and I was impressed, as much of her wondrous life, from her youth up to her monastic tonsure, as by the homilies this blessed eldress delivered to her nuns in order to instruct them well in the monastic way of life in Christ. I did not meet the blessed eldress in the flesh, but I met her in spirit when I read her homilies, which originated from her illumined heart. In speaking of the heart, I do not mean her emotional world, for she expressed herself in a manly, hesychistic manner, nor the biological organ of the heart, but rather the deep heart, Psalm 63, 7, which the grace of God set apart and trained through her struggle of many years. She obeyed the exhortation of Christ, My son, give me thine heart, Proverbs twenty three twenty six and she gave her heart to him who made it his abode. But the blessed eldress does not need particular introductions from me, for she has the necessary praise from all those who have ascertained the truth of her words. To begin with, she has the endorsement of her spiritual fathers, Yeren Yosif, the Hezekist, and Archimandrite Ephrem, former abbot of the holy monastery of Philotheu Marathos. Both of these two elders are genuine bearers of the orthodox niptic and Hezekistic tradition. After many struggles, years of struggles, but also after repeated visitations of divine grace, Yerunda Yosif, a great hezekist of our days, transmitted to the eldress of blessed memory the treasure and wealth of the hezekistic way of life, which he lived on Manathos. With his letters, his prayers, and his very guidance, Yerunda Yosif made her a worker of noetic prayer of the heart and of noetic hezekiah, and then she brought the mystic heartbeat of Manathos to her monastery. But also Archimandrite Ephraim, former abbot of the Holy Monastery of Philotheu, Manathos, assures us of the genuineness of her spiritual state. In the foreword to this book, his testimony is of great importance, since he states that Yorondasa was distinguished for her humility, meekness, attentiveness, and unceasing prayer. In particular, he assures us categorically, and this is of great importance, that Yorondasa Makrina had great purity of nous, I have never met anyone with such purity of thought, in quotes. And also that as a nun, quote, she had unquestioning obedience and great precision in her monastic duties. Also, her spiritual disciples assure us concerning Yorondas and Makrina that she struggled to impart to us the spirit of Hezekism and Athenite monasticism, as she was taught it by our grandfather, Papu, Yerund Yosif the Hezekist, and our Yerund father Ephraim of Philotheu. May their blessing be upon us. Our Yorondasa of blessed memory was a heavenly human being and an earthly angel. She was shown forth indeed as a ama, that is, a spiritual mother, and her disciples experienced this hezekistic tradition and transmitted it to other monasteries in Greece, America, and Canada. Thus the blessed Eldress was a true child of hezekist fathers and the mother of hezekistic monasteries, which carry in our age the preeminent way of orthodox monasticism, which does not concern itself with activism, but with the experience of life in Christ, as the tradition of our church preserves it. Her longing for God was strong, her love like unto the love of the hermits and the martyrs, her internal noetic prayer of the heart unceasing, her love toward people unfailing and noble. This longing of hers led her to seek to meet and converse with our other blessed saints and empirical theologians of our age, such as St. Porfirios, St. Paisios, the Venerable Sophia, Father Ephraim of Catanachia, Father Philotheus Zervakos, Father Euronymus of Egina, St. Yakovo Salikis, and Father Sophroni Sakharov. The life of every person who loves God, especially of every struggling monastic, is a mystery. All of a person's communication and relation with God takes place in the depth of his heart and is oft times secret and hidden from the attention of men. 
Only when someone has a duty to train others in Christ is he then compelled to teach them from his own experience. And so some of his secret experiences are revealed. Thus it is explained how, from among the many women who had real experiences of the hesychistic life, the only ones who became known were those who, as eldresses, exercised a pastoral ministry to their nuns. This means that the life of a monastic is a mystery inaccessible to most people, and God allows only some of its effluents to be revealed to those who thirst for this way of life and desire it, for it is understood only by those who share the same experiences with them. St. Dionysius the Areopagite, speaking of the therapist that is of the monk, writes that the monastic and sacred state, state is obedient to the priestly orders and is led up by them as an obedient follower to the divine science of the sacred mysteries that are permitted to, this, to its order. The fact that the monk during the monastic tonsure is sealed on the head shows the ineffectuality of all carnal actions and the cutting of the hairs of his head express the pure life that is beyond description and its ascent toward the vision of God by unitary and monastic signs of beauty and not human ones. Referring to all the services in the church, the same saint writes that the holy services are purification, illumination, and perfection. The servers, the deacons, constitute the purifying order. The priests constitute the illuminating order, and the godlike hierarchs constitute the perfecting order. The order that is being purified has no part in the sacred vision, for it is still in the process of purification. The people are the theoretical order in the church, and the perfect order is the order of the unitary monks who have a life that is single in form. Thus, within the church, the real people of God, to which the monks belong as well, is not simply all those who have been baptized, but rather all those whose faith is firmly established. According to St. Simeon, the new theologian, they constitute the so-called theoretical order, who have theoria of God, who see God in his glory, in his light. They also constitute the perfect order, whose powers have all been unified and point toward God. In the true monastic, three divine liturgies are united, that is, the divine liturgy in the church, in which one communes of the body and blood of Christ, is closely related to the divine liturgy that takes place within the noetic altar of the heart with noetic prayer in the Holy Spirit, and to the divine liturgy that is celebrated in the heavens as the evangelist John presents it in the book of the Revelation. In the saints, all three of these liturgies are united with one another. Indeed, when the mysteries of baptism and chrismation are celebrated, at the same time, the consecration of the internal church in the heart takes place. Since the grace of God, according to St. Diodokos of Photiki, enters deeply into the heart, and there the internal divine liturgy begins to take place. When later with repentance and noetic prayer, this grace of baptism and chrismation is activated, then a person enters upon a charismatic life with illumination of the noose, theoria of the saints and angels, participation in the uncreated light, and also participation in the heavenly divine liturgy. Then his presence in church during the celebration of the divine liturgy is an activation of the internal divine liturgy and a participation in the heavenly divine liturgy. We see this in the homilies of the blessed Eurondasa Makrina. She received from her elders the entire holy deposit, the spiritual inheritance of the hesychistic tradition, and she preserved it in the depth of her heart by many struggles and she tasted its fruits. Along with the divine liturgy, she sensed the noetic liturgy in her heart, and she participated in varying degrees in the heavenly divine liturgy. This spiritual food nourished her whole being, and from there, as a good spiritual mother, she fed her nuns. I can say that with the help of her spiritual father, the Archimandrite Ephraim of Philotheu, she brought the eremitic and hesychistic life of Yerunda Yosef the Hesychist, which is unapproachable not only for many lay people, but also for many monks, into Cenobitic monasticism in a practical manner, with purity of thoughts, obedience, prayer, and self-denial. Thus, when one reads her discourses, he understands in a particular, in a practical and concise way, how noetic prayer develops within a person and how he is led from the image to the likeness. 
When one reads Holy Scripture carefully, he will find that the whole spiritual life of man develops around the noose and the heart, and he will understand how the heart is purified and how the noose of man acquires knowledge of God. This life that we encounter in the discourses of the Blessed Eurondesa Macrina is the prophetic life, as we see it in the prophets and the choir of the prophets of the Old Testament. It is the apostolic life and the life of the first Christians with its various gifts that they had, a life that differs in many respects from the modern secularized Christian life of many Christians. Thus the choir of the prophets, the choir of the twelve apostles that followed Christ, the mighty wind of Pentecost that made the disciples of Christ and the first Christians drunk with the sober drunkenness of the Holy Spirit is experienced within Orthodox monasticism. And for this reason, Orthodox monasticism constitutes a renewal of the life of the prophets, the life of the apostles, the life of the first Christians, the life of the martyrs, but also the life of the great anchorites and ascetics, as St. John Chrysostom describes it. We see this life throughout the epistles of the Apostle Paul, by which he was directing the Christians of his time, whom he elevated spiritually. All these things can be found in his epistles, and they constitute necessary guarantees of the prophetic and apostolic life. The Apostle Paul speaks about the divine Sabbath rest that is holy hesychism. See Hebrews 4.9. About Christ dwelling in our hearts. See Ephesians 3.17 about the spirit that intercedes in man with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. See Romans 8, 26. About the drunkenness from being filled with the Holy Spirit by chanting psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs in the heart. See Ephesians 5, verses 18 to 19. About putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 13, 14. About experiencing the mystery of the cross by being removed from the world and then by the removal of the world from within us. So Galatians 6.14 About the cry of the Holy Spirit in the heart by which the adoption in Christ by the Father is confirmed. So Romans 8.14-16 About the ascent to the third heaven and the rapture into paradise and about the unutterable words that he heard which no one can express. 2 Corinthians 12.1-4 And so on. Despite the scriptural, patristic, hymnological, and hagiographical do documentation, it is possible that some may still doubt the charismatic states that are presented in Yorondo Samakrina's homilies. This may be explained by the fact that modern Christianity is largely secularized. It has been greatly influenced by the scholastic spirit, in which philosophy and contemplation are overemphasized, or by the moralistic and emotional way of life or by an external reading of Holy Scripture that remains in the latter, in the letter and kills the Spirit, the Spirit that gives life to man, John 6, 63. Indeed, it can be observed that modern Christianity is largely pervaded by an external piety without purification of the heart and illumination of the noose, and by a spirit of the enlightenment and of romanticism that is far from the prophetic, apostolic, and patristic mindset of the Church. From her experienced spiritual fathers, the Blessed Yorondas and Macrina learned the orthodox methodology and the orthodox way of acquiring knowledge of God. She learned how the prayer passes from the mouth into the noose and into the heart by the power of the Holy Spirit, how one can have an illumined noose and keep it pure, how to live the monastic life with inspiration, how to practice noetic prayer of the heart. She herself had acquired many spiritual experiences of the hesychistic life, and in this manner she taught her nuns so that they might attain their salvation. Her words are characteristic, quote, When we pursue God and say the prayer at every moment, then the grace of God will pursue us, end quote. Which reminds us of the discourses of St. Gregory the Theologian and St. Gregory of Nyssa. She recommended that we set prayer in the bosom, in the heart, which reminds us of the words of Christ concerning watchfulness and prayer. She said that when one lives within prayer, the soul hears angelic voices and sees the glory and majesty of God, which reminds us of the experiences of the Apostle Paul. When a person lives hesychistically and prayerfully, he senses the Holy Spirit, which is like the breeze, like the dew, which refreshes wherever it falls. Sometimes it comes as a flame, and you wonder from where this fire came, 
or it comes as a breeze, and you look around you to see whence it comes, but you don't see anything because these spiritual states take place within the soul, which reminds us of the experiences of the prophets. Yoranda Samakrina, through her way of life, understood that God is very alive. With such a living God, men also are alive by grace, released from the passions and acquiring all virtue. Despite these astounding words of hers, however, we can discern that she herself had profound humility and love for Christ, and for this reason she desired to join her nuns to him. She used to say with strong self-reproach, which is the authentic mindset of monastic, the monastic life, do not depend on me. I am a monstrosity, a dead worm, full of passions and weaknesses. You must cling to the neck of Christ. All that has been written in this book shows the therapeutic nature of Orthodox theology. It describes how the Orthodox Church heals man, how selfish love is transformed into selfless love, how self-love is transformed into love for God and love for one's fellow man. This is the central meaning of Orthodox psychotherapy. Indeed, the Church is the spiritual hospital that heals the spiritual ailments of man and leads him into communion with God and his brothers. This is also the deeper meaning of Orthodox monasticism. The Venerable Makrina was blessed. All who read her discourses with, with prayer will sense the fragrance of Yorondasa's prayer, the scent of the desert of Mount Athos, as it was experienced in a Sinopitic monastery, the spiritual life of this true child of true Hezekistic fathers, the true mother of blessed nuns, signed in January 2000. 17. He wrote this Vlakos of Nafpaktos. Forward to the Greek edition by Yeron de Ephrem of St. Anthony's Monastery, Florence, Arizona, and former abbot of Philotheu Monastery, Manathos, Greece. The holy monastery of Panagia Odikrika was the first women's monastery that I received under my spiritual guidance in obedience to my holy Yeronda Yosif the Hezekist, shortly before he passed away. Footnote, located in Portaria, a village near the city of Volos, Greece, this monastery is a Matokion of the holy monastery of Philotheu on Manathos. A Matokion is a monastery or church that is outside of the area of the main monastery to which it belongs. To continue. My venerable Yeranda had been corresponding with the informal sisterhood, which first began in the village of Stagiatis in Pelion. Pelion is the mountain overlooking the city of Volos. He nurtured them, introduced them to the monastic life and the patristic traditions. With his prayers, he contributed to the establishment of the monastery in Portaria, and he left me as their spiritual guide. My Yeranda took part in the selection of the monastery's Yerondisa, after a revelation from God during his time of prayer. The task to undertake the toilsome duty of ministering to the souls of the sisterhood was accepted with great difficulty by Yorondasa Makrina, as she considered herself unworthy. Yorondasa Makrina underwent enormous trials even from her childhood years. I knew her from the world. She had a special spiritual relationship with my blessed mother, Yorondasa Theophano, who supported her in many ways because she was an orphan. Yorondasa Makrina was an extremely virtuous person, distinguished for her humility, meekness, attentiveness, and unceasing prayer. She had great purity of noose. I have never met anyone with such purity of thought. As a nun, she had unquestioning obedience and great precision in her monastic duties. Divine fear, remembrance of death, and the divine destination of man were cultivated in her soul from her youth and became her way of life. Her infinite patience, love, and vigilant concern for the salvation of the sisterhood continually occupied her. The problems with which people approached her always became her own problems. She strived with her prayers and words to help them find solutions. With the blessing of God under Yorondas' guidance, this monastery of Panagia, Odrytria became the source of many other mon monasteries that were established in Greece as well as in America and Canada. Now her soul is at rest, just as she gave me rest, and she rejoices eternally in paradise along with the choir of holy virgins. 
I, the least of all, humbly pray that she intercedes from our synodia in heaven for the salvation of her spiritual children and the entire world. Signed, Yaranda from Holy Monastery St. Anthony the Great, Florence, Arizona, on the leave-taking of Pascha, 2011. Preface to the English Edition By the grace of God, the Sisterhood of the Holy Monastery of St. John the Forerunner is publishing in English the translation of the book Words of the Heart, which the Holy Monastery of the Mother of God, Odiritria of Portaria Volos, published in Greek five years ago in 2012, concerning the founder and eldress of blessed memory of the aforementioned monastery, the nun Macrina, Vasopulu. The Holy Monastery of St. John the Forerunner now offers this book, which circulated widely in Greece and brought great benefit to souls, to their English-speaking brethren, for their support. They do this moved by brotherly love, but also by a sense of duty and honor to the sacred memory of their beloved mother, and so that the lamp of the holy personality of Eurondusa Macrina might not remain under a bushel, see Matthew 5.15, for their brethren in America. Eurondusa Macrina is a rare flower in the garden of modern women's monasticism. According to the plan of divine providence, in her infancy she was transplanted to Greece from Asia Minor, the birthplace of saints. With her simple but grace-filled speech, she spoke and still speaks directly to the souls of all. Then with her living voice, now through her discourses as the present book preserves them, inasmuch as it consists of the recorded homilies that she gave at private meetings of the sisterhood of her monastery between 1971 and 1992. Her simple speech speaks to the hearts of all, for it comes from her actual, authentic, holy experiences and her love and care to give to her spiritual children, inside and outside her monastery, whatever she herself had tasted by the grace of God and whatever her long monastic experience has taught her. A person of praxis and theoria, Eurondisa was rich in virtues, and she was and still is a guide of others towards Christ and a model of an authentic spiritual person in our despiritualized age, when virtuous examples to follow are becoming increasingly difficult to find. However, blessed is God, who even today does not leave himself without witnesses in the world. Signed, Stavros Kourousis, Professor Emeritus of Byzantine Literature, University of Athens. Publisher's footnote on Theoria. It is difficult to find an exact English equivalent for the Greek word theoria, and it is used in the Orthodox tradition, written and oral. In English, there are the words meditation and contemplation. The word theoria should in no way be confused with the word meditation, since this is used by Eastern religions and sects. It is rendered in Greek by the word dialogismos and has an entirely different content. The second word, contemplation, is acceptable as a translation of the word theoria, but again with a different content. In the same lexicon, see the patristic Greek lexicon where the word theoria is interpreted as spiritual contemplation. The verb theoro is interpreted, contemplate mystically through the agency of the Holy Spirit. St. Gregory the Theologian in his fourth discourse teaches us Quote, theoria is good and praxis is good. One, i.e., theoria, rises up from here and proceeds into the Holy of Holies. End of quote. That is, it raises us up from earthly things and brings us into spiritual things, into heavenly things, thus imitating Mary. Quote, the other, that, I, that is praxis, receives Christ and serves him, as did Martha. See Luke ten thirty-eight to 42 St. Isaac the Syrian also gives a definition of theoria. Quote, theoria is a sense of the divine mysteries that are hidden in things and causes. St. Isaac, ascetical discourse number two. These passages decisively demonstrate theoria as the spiritual person experiences it in the Orthodox Church, always in the Holy Spirit. Eurondisa Macrina, in her discourses, was accustomed to use the expressions, quote, I come into theoria, End quote, or, quote, I do theoria. In both cases, the word theoria was being used with a content that pertains to the Holy Spirit, as theoria is known 
and as it is experienced in the Orthodox tradition. In the first case, it refers to the carrying away of the noose by the action of the Holy Spirit into the spiritual realm, where a person experiences divine things for as long as God wills. This usually occurs during the time of prayer. In the second case, a person by his own will leads his noose beyond earthly and perceptible things and circumstances into the spiritual realm for asceticism and because of his desire to rise above sinful and passionate things. End of footnote, end of the preface to the English edition. Preface to the English edition. By the grace of God, the Sisterhood of the Holy Monastery of St. John the Forerunner is publishing in English the translation of the book Words of the Heart, which the Holy Monastery of the Mother of God, Odiritria of Portaria Volos, published in Greek five years ago in 2012, concerning the founder and eldress of blessed memory of the aforementioned monastery, the nun Macrina, Vasopulu. The Holy Monastery of St. John the Forerunner now offers this book, which circulated widely in Greece and brought great benefit to souls, to their English-speaking brethren, for their support. They do this moved by brotherly love, but also by a sense of duty and honor to the sacred memory of their beloved mother, and so that the lamp of the holy personality of Eurondusa Macrina might not remain under a bushel, see Matthew 5.15, for their brethren in America. Eurondusa Macrina is a rare flower in the garden of modern women's monasticism. According to the plan of divine providence, in her infancy she was transplanted to Greece from Asia Minor, the birthplace of saints. With her simple but grace-filled speech, she spoke and still speaks directly to the souls of all. Then with her living voice, now through her discourses as the present book preserves them, inasmuch as it consists of the recorded homilies that she gave at private meetings of the Sisterhood of her monastery between 1971 and 1992. Her simple speech speaks to the hearts of all, for it comes from her actual, authentic, holy experiences and her love and care to give to her spiritual children, inside and outside her monastery, whatever she herself had tasted by the grace of God and whatever her long monastic experience has taught her. A person of praxis and theoria, Eurondisa was rich in virtues, and she was and still is a guide of others towards Christ and a model of an authentic spiritual person in our despiritualized age, when virtuous examples to follow are becoming increasingly difficult to find. However, blessed is God, who even today does not leave himself without witnesses in the world. Signed, Stavros Kourousis, Professor Emeritus of Byzantine Literature, University of Athens. Publisher's footnote on Theoria. It is difficult to find an exact English equivalent for the Greek word theoria, and it is used in the Orthodox tradition, written and oral. In English, there are the words meditation and contemplation. The word theoria should in no way be confused with the word meditation, since this is used by Eastern religions and sects. It is rendered in Greek by the word dialogismos and has an entirely different content. The second word, contemplation, is acceptable as a translation of the word theoria, but again with a different content. In the same lexicon, see the patristic Greek lexicon where the word theoria is interpreted as spiritual contemplation. The verb theoro is interpreted, contemplate mystically through the agency of the Holy Spirit. St. Gregory the Theologian in his fourth discourse teaches us Quote, theoria is good and praxis is good. One, i.e., theoria, rises up from here and proceeds into the Holy of Holies. End of quote. That is, it raises us up from earthly things and brings us into spiritual things, into heavenly things, thus imitating Mary. Quote, the other, that, I, that is praxis, receives Christ and serves him, as did Martha. See Luke ten thirty-eight to 42. St. Isaac the Syrian also gives a definition of theoria. Quote, theoria is a sense of the divine mysteries that are hidden in things and causes. St. Isaac, ascetical discourse number two. These passages decisively demonstrate theoria as the spiritual person experiences it in the Orthodox Church, always in the Holy Spirit. 
Yoranda Samakrina in her discourses was accustomed to use the expressions, quote, I come into theoria, end quote, or, quote, I do theoria. In both cases, the word theoria was being used with a content that pertains to the Holy Spirit, as theoria is known and as it is experienced in the Orthodox tradition. In the first case, it refers to the carrying away of the noose by the action of the Holy Spirit into the spiritual realm, where a person experiences divine things for as long as God wills. This usually occurs during the time of prayer. In the second case, a person by his own will leads his noose beyond earthly and perceptible things and circumstances into the spiritual realm for asceticism and because of his desire to rise above sinful and passionate things. End of footnote, end of the preface to the English edition. Preface to the Greek edition. By the grace of God, 17 years after the departure to the Lord of our Yeronda Samakrina of blessed memory, our holy monastery of Panagio Odushria in Portaea Volos, which had the divine blessing of being under her inspired leadership for more than 30 years, 1963 to 1995, offers to our brethren in, in Christ the book that you hold in your hands. It is offered for those who knew her in remembrance of her simple, grace-filled, and illumined teaching, and for those who did not know her, as a small yet sweet taste of her words and an acquaintance with her person and life. The events in her biography were taken both from what Eurondissa related to us herself for the purpose of spiritual upbringing and from the memories of the older sisters, especially those who walked the spiritual path with her from the time she was a young girl. Additional information was gathered from her relatives. Great lengths were taken to cross-check the information as thoroughly as possible, because Eurondissa desired to live in obscurity and silence. What we have presented about her life and experiences is slight, and perhaps we do her an injustice in comparison with the multitude of spiritual states she actually experienced. The main body of the book consists of talks recorded on tape, which Yorondasa gave to the sisterhood during our gatherings from 1971 to 1992 for the purpose of teaching, counseling, strengthening, and censuring. Of course, they are only a small part of her homilies, as there was not always the possibility or the foresight to record them on tape. The homilies are presented in chronological order. If the exact date of a homily is unknown, an approximation is used. Our minimal intervention into the text of the homilies took place only where it was necessary for better comprehension, something always necessary when the spoken word is transcribed, especially when spoken impromptu. We did not remove frequent repetitions that exist in various homilies so as not to abbreviate them and thus affect their coherence and structure. Rather than changing the spontaneous personal style and losing the refreshing character of Eurondus' spoken word, an effort was made to keep the words as spoken by our mother of blessed memory, including idioms and local dialect, mixed patterns of demonic and purist Greek, and different forms of verbs and nouns. References have been supplied for quotations from Holy Scripture and patristic texts, except for a few patristic texts that we were unable to locate. We would like to warmly thank all the brethren who helped with the completion and publication of this book, whether materially or through their labors. First of all, however, we owe special thanks to our spiritual father and Yeronda, Father Ephraim, former abbot of the Holy Monastery of Philotheu on Manathos, who also wrote the prologue. We humbly pray that the readers delight in the life and homilies of Yerondus and Macrina will prove spiritually beneficial to the glory of God. This would also be a consolation to us and would constitute a small tribute of gratitude and honor to the sacred memory of our Holy Mother, whose constant request and prayer was the salvation of the entire world. Signed, the Holy Monastery of Panagia, Odus Dictria, Metokian of the Holy Monastery, Philotheu, Marathos, Portaria, Volos, Pasca, 2012. Two childhood years. Maria grew up in the refugee neighborhoods of Nia Aonia, where she began going to school. She was an excellent student, 
but due to exceptionally harsh conditions and the difficult circumstances of her life, she was forced to give up her schooling in the early elementary grades. Although her general education was lacking, she loved learning the things of God and would continue to study the Holy Scriptures, lives of the saints, hymnology, and the ascetical works of the Holy Fathers diligently throughout her life. As a young child, she was not interested in childish games like her peers. Despite her tender age, she was distinguished for her maturity and serious nature. It appeared that God was preparing her for a different path. When she was seven years old, the Lord called her to the angelic life of monasticism in a blessed and grace-filled way. One spring day, as Maria was playing in a field near her house with other children, she asked them all to come together and pray. Pondering with her childish mind, she asked the other children how they could reach God. With simplicity and faith, Maria suggested the possibility of reaching him by placing many tables and chairs on top of each other. Then when they began to chant, Lord have mercy, she heard an inner voice calling her to the monastic life. Having already within her the holy desire to reach and touch God, a divine transformation came into her heart at that moment and for the first time she felt such compunction that she began to cry. She left the other children to continue playing and ran home, where she fell weeping before the holy icons. Maria's mother, worried at seeing her in this condition, took her daughter in her arms and tenderly asked what had happened. Sobbing, Maria answered that she wanted to become a nun. She did not truly understand the full meaning of those words, as no one had ever spoken to her about the monastic life as a special path leading to God. She did not even know what the garments of monastics looked like. The desire for monasticism was manifested in her soul at the moment of her improvised, innocent prayer. Every time her father would return home from work, Maria had the loving custom of taking off his shoes and putting his slippers on his feet to relieve him after his long, hard day. That evening, however, Maria did not appear. Worried, Photius inquired of his wife, who informed him of the events of that day. He called for Maria and asked her to explain to him exactly what had happened. When she answered that she desired to become a nun, her father asked her three times, What does it mean to be a nun? Little Maria shrugged her tiny shoulders without answering. Her father understood that it was a calling from God. He smiled at her, and with all the affection of his fatherly heart, he encouraged her divine yearning for the monastic life. Then Photius asked Maria to bring him water in one of the glasses intended for guests. As if he had before him a mature, responsible person, his own age rather than a seven-year-old child, he blessed her, saying, May you be a good nun, my child. The path she would follow in life was now appointed by God, and blessed by her father. Maria cultivated the divine calling in her soul all the years she lived in the world, and with the blessing of her parents, progressed prudently and bravely until the time she was made worthy of the monastic tonsure and the angelic schema. The happy, carefree years of Maria's childhood spent with her parents were very short-lived. As she would say, I would later long for those years with tears. I lost the warmth of the family nest and was deprived forever of the affectionate embrace of my parents. Those years with her parents, God-loving guidance and counsels, sealed her pure soul in Christ. Her perfect adherence in word and deed to their teachings brought honor to their memory. She would frequently recall the wise words of her father, quote, My child, for the worst thing that someone does to you, you will in turn do for them the best. Show your love to everyone, and God will repay you abundantly. And so, from childhood, Maria showed love and great respect to everyone, even if they wronged her. When Maria was eight years old, her father had a vision from God about his approaching death, as well as the death of his wife, revealing that their children would be left alone. An angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Photius, on clean Monday at four o'clock, I will come to take you, and exactly one year later, I will come for your wife. Do not worry about your children. A great hand will cover them, and divine grace will protect them. Maria's father received the divine message with tremendous faith. Just as he was informed, so it came to be. Eight days before he passed away, 
Photius spoke with his wife to prepare her for his approaching end and to inform her of her own impending death one year later. In tears, he strove to console her with the divine promise that their two children would be protected by God's providence. Indeed, Photius fell asleep peacefully on Clean Monday in 1929. One year later on Clean Monday of 1930, his wife, Anastasia, fell asleep in the Lord. At the age of nine, Maria and her four-year-old brother, George, were deprived of the care and affection of their parents. The pain of their loss was tremendous. Yorondisa would later relate that following her mother's death, she would frequently go to her parents' simple and humble grave, digging in the dirt with her little hands, searching in her childlike simplicity to find them. Little Maria sought love in the embrace of friends and neighbors, but when they tried to tie bows in her hair, she resisted and pulled them out, asserting, I don't want such things because I am going to become a nun. The harsh and bitter years of life as an orphan became even more difficult because of the poverty of the struggling Greek people under the German occupation during the Second World War. Eurondisa would later convey how there were times when they did not have even one piece of bread and death from starvation loomed before their eyes. The neighbors helped the two orphans as much as they could and as much as the needs of their own families would allow. Occasionally, by God's providence, the two siblings would find a basket of food in their yard. They would stand at watch from their window, but they were never able to see who left it. After her parents fell asleep in the Lord, Maria took on all the household responsibilities, including the role of mother to raise her four-year-old brother, George. Maria and her brother lived in a small refugee home that shared a roof with the adjacent household of their unmarried aunt, which was a common way to build refugee shelters. This aunt was short-tempered and had the evil habit of blaspheming. She often spoke harshly to Maria and beat her. Maria, however, never talked back to her, but with great forbearance, true love, and respect towards her aunt, endured her bad behavior. Every time her aunt blasphemed, little Maria refused to eat her food and remain hungry until her aunt stopped blaspheming. Thus enlightened by God, she managed little by little to convert her aunt to the path of piety and convinced her in the end to confess and receive Holy Communion before her death. Securing the daily means for survival was a primary concern for the two orphaned children. For this reason, their aunt pressured little Maria to find work to support themselves. Though only nine years old, Maria worked for the first time in the home of a wealthy family. As soon as she arrived, she was given an apron and a towel and was asked to wash the dishes. The cupboard where the dishes were kept contained a stack of 50 plates. As little Maria attempted to take down the first row of plates and then the second row, she broke a plate. Due to her sensitivity and delicate conscience, she became very upset began to cry and returned to home right away. Her aunt immediately asked her sternly why she had returned so soon. Maria explained to her that she was unable to continue working due to the damage she had accidentally caused. She later found work shelling almonds for a small company. Often her youthful little fingers would bleed from using a rock to crack the shells. From early childhood, Maria loved the Panagia immensely and placed all her hope in her even more so after she lost her parents. She had the Panagia as her mother and entrusted all her problems and requests to her. When, as a vulnerable orphan, Maria began to work, the merciful Lord strengthened her in her monastic calling with a wondrous vision. Maria found herself in a very beautiful, lush, green garden. A woman clothed in black approached her, holding the hand of a three-year-old child. Suddenly, the child left his mother's hand and began to run in the grass. The woman then called Maria by name and asked her to catch the child, promising to give her a gift if she managed to do so. Maria accepted willingly, and after great effort, she grabbed the child and embraced him, asking, How sweet is Christ? The child did not answer, but placing both hands around his mouth, he blew into her mouth, immediately filling her soul with a sweetness and fragrance. The woman in black then took two rings and placed one on the finger 
of the little child and one on Maria's finger. For the next few years, Maria did not want to taste anything sweet and risk losing the inexpressible feeling of grace that strengthened her decision to become a nun. After her spiritual engagement, Maria began to wear a head covering and only dark colored clothing, living from that time on as a nun in the world. Along with her spiritual struggle, Maria's daily effort to survive continued, forcing her to work again as a housemaid for another family. One day, a Hira monk visited the home where she was working. At that moment, Maria was attempting to light a fire in the boiler to heat water so she could wash clothes, but was having difficulty because the fire kept going out. The Hira monk, seeing Maria's sorrow, approached her and asked with fatherly care what was wrong. Maria explained the problem she was having lighting the fire. The Hira monk made the sign of the cross over the wood three times in the name of the Holy Trinity and told her to blow on it with faith. Immediately, the fire lit. This incident proved, provided the opportunity for Maria to become acquainted with the Hira monk. His name was Father Ephrem Karagianis, and he became her spiritual father in the world. Hira monk Ephrem was from the Synodia of Yerunda Yosif the Hezekist, who lived from 1897 to 1959, an Athenite elder, and was serving as the parish priest at the church of St. Apostolos the New in Volos. Father Ephrem brought the hesychistic tradition of the Holy Fathers to the area, teaching noetic prayer and acquainting many people in the city of Volos with the Holy Mountain and yet under Yosif the hesychist. Throughout the numerous difficulties in Maria's life, divine providence always carved the path of her spiritual journey in a wondrous way. At about the age of 11, Maria worked again as a housemaid in the home of a wealthy woman. One day, while she was cleaning the house, two men came to visit the lady of the house and sat down in the living room to speak with her. From the adjacent room, Maria heard the lady ask them how much money they would give her to purchase her young housemaid. Maria immediately understood their evil intentions, and she quickly opened the window, jumped out into the street, and ran away crying. She was so distressed that she could not remember the way home. A man who saw her in that state offered to help her, and she asked him to show her the way home. Thus she was saved from grave danger. The grace of God always protected little Maria and soon guided her to a better work environment. Some ladies from the refugee settlement suggested that she work at the Masangu cigarette factory in Volos. Maria was about 12 years old but looked older. The ladies presented her to the factory manager as 13 so she would be able to be eligible to work there. She was hired, but due to her young age, she only counted boxes for the first two years. The manager of the factory, the ever-memorable Apostolos Somonglu and his wife Magdalene were pious people who regularly attended the church of St. Apostolos. They had the same spiritual father as Maria. One day, the manager called Maria to the workroom where they assigned her on a trial basis to count cigarettes. Maria was a very fast worker and had twice the production of her co-workers. Maria practiced the prayer unceasingly while she worked and tried not to let her work disrupt her spiritual exercise. She prayed that God would illumine her to grasp the exact number of cigarettes needed for each package without counting so as not to disrupt her prayer. Years later, Yorondasa related how she would say with childlike simplicity and much faith in Christ, My Christ, I will say the prayer to you, and you count the cigarettes. Miraculously, every time the manager would inspect her work, he never found a deficiency in the packages she prepared. When they offered to raise her wages to reward her increased output, she preferred to share the extra prepared packages with her co-workers. At work, Maria was distinguished by her polite manners, moral standards, and philotimo, modesty and silence. According to the testimony of her co-workers, her face glowed and her mouth was fragrant from unceasing prayer. With her first wages from the factory, she arranged for the 40-day liturgies to be served for the repose of the souls of her parents. Her spiritual father undertook this task and Maria attended every day. 
At three o'clock in the morning, she got ready and left by foot on a one-hour journey from Nia Ionia to the Church of St. Apostolos the New. After the Divine Liturgy, she went straight to work. Throughout the days of the 40 liturgies, she also prayed at home for the souls of her parents. When the day of the 40th liturgy came, right before she woke up, in between sleep and wakefulness, she found herself in a very green garden with blossoming trees, like almond trees in the springtime. Hearing in her mind that this place belonged to her parents, she was moved with emotion and began to call for them. When they appeared before her, with yearning, she said she sat with them with yearning if they were at rest. If Logison, they joyfully answered, "Where were where we were was good, but now we are even better off." After the vision, she got ready and went to the last divine liturgy. As soon as it was over and her spiritual father gave her Andiron, she asked her to wait so he could talk to her. After a little while, Hiramonk Ephraim approached her and asked how she felt in prayer about her parents. Before she could answer, he told her that he had seen them the night before, exactly as she had seen them. After that, Maria realized what great value the 40 liturgies have. And later, when she became a spiritual guide to others, she would also recommend this to people, both for the repose of the departed souls and for the health and strength for people in difficult situations. 3. Adolescence Far from the delights of the world, Maria continued with precision on her spiritual journey and remained steadfast in her sacred decision to become a nun. For this reason, the all-good Lord and giver of gifts allowed her, even from a young age, to live certain wondrous events in order for her to acquire beneficial experience and support in her spiritual struggle. One morning, while holding her prayer rope on her way to work, the devil appeared to her on the road and said, Ah, what I would do to you if you were not holding what you have in your hand. From that time on, she was even more persistent with her prayer rope and the prayer. When she did not have a prayer rope with her, she would rub her overcoat with her little fingers as she said the prayer, so much that the fabric at that spot of the coat became worn out. As time passed, the difficulties of poverty continually worsened. Maria felt embarrassed to seek help in managing her obligations, so rather than having both her and her brother suffer from hunger, in 1935, she decided to send George to their uncle and Legata outside of Thessaloniki. She did not go herself so as not to be a burden. She was now all alone with Christ and the Panagia as her only protection and hope. Her brother soon left Legata for Thessaloniki and lived there with his godfather for nearly six years until he finished high school. During that time, Maria had not heard anything from him, and she greatly feared for his life. So great was her concern that she considered having a memorial service done for him, believing that her brother was no longer alive. However, she first arranged that a divine liturgy in honor of St. Minas be celebrated, and in less than one week she received a letter from George. Footnote, St. Minas is commemorated on November 11th, he is particularly called upon for the finding of lost objects. He wrote to her that an invisible hand had suddenly urged him to send her a letter, and he informed her that soon he would be returning. When he returned from Thessaloniki, George stayed for a little while in Volos and then went on to Athens in an effort to find work. Maria supported George financially and morally, and from time to time went to Athens to care for him. Throughout the various difficulties that arose, Maria would pray that the mercy of God would not abandon them and begged that someone would be found who could help them. God, the provider of all, soon sent them a wealthy and pious man of Greek descent from Egypt. He was a descendant of the Ambet family and he had significantly benefited the Greeks in Egypt and had played an important role in the founding of the Soteria Hospital in Athens which specialized in the treatment of tuberculosis. This man was a godsend and supported them immensely. He arranged for George to study accounting and foreign languages and secured work for him in the palace. Greece, footnote, was a monarchy at this time. To continue, Maria vividly kept her fi father's final words in her mind. Quote, a great hand will be found to protect the children. And 
As a result, she always trusted in the providence of God throughout all of her life's difficulties. As she related later, by the grace of God, she and her brother met good people who protected and advised them, showing them much love as if they were their parents. Victoria Maratu, 1887 to 18, 1984, was an extremely spiritual person who stood by Maria like a mother. She held a special place in Maria's life during the years she was struggling in the world and later on during her life as a nun. This was the blessed mother of the future Yerunda Ephrem. Victoria lived with deep spirituality and later became a nun with the name Theophano. She and Maria had the same spiritual father. He would often say to his spiritual children, all of you together don't equal one Victoria. Because Maria was an orphan, Victoria would give her advice and took interest in her material needs. When Maria would visit her after work, Victoria would give her food. If for some reason Maria did not stop by their house, she would send the food with her son, Johnny, yet on Ephraim's name before his monastic tonsure. Concerning the relationship between Maria and his mother, Yerunda Ephraim later recalled, quote, During the time Maria worked for the Matsangu cigarette factory, she would pass by our house each day on her way to work. She had such a bond with my mother. It was indescribable. These two women had great love for each other. End of quote. They would frequently read and pray all night together with tears and prostrations. Maria had great respect and reverence for Victoria and looked up, up to her as a mother and a Yerondisa. At that time, prior to the Second World War, Maria's spiritual father had several virtuous young men and women among his spiritual children in Volos who lived as nuns in the world. Likewise, although she lived and worked in the world, Maria loved asceticism and was devoted, devoted with precision to the struggles and duties of the monastic life which she had desired from childhood. Her unfailing attendance and compunction at the divine services, her personal vigils, prostrations, and noetic prayer, her studying of the scriptures, lives of the saints, and patristic texts, all of these were the joy of her young soul. Her spiritual sisters lived the same holy life. They occupied themselves day and night with the prayer, Theoria of Paradise, and Remembrance of Death, after the Divine Liturgy, they would take Andiraon and depart in silence so as not to lose the prayer and the grace of God. Maria went every year with her spiritual sisters to the feast of St. Apostolos the New in the village of St. Lawrence in Pelion. They would remain in prayer and vigil for three or four days in the saint's church. Crowds of pilgrims would gather there from all over Greece, many of whom were sick and sought healing. On one of the many pil their pil pilgrimages to the church of St. Apostolos, Maria saw a reverend elder who appeared to be an ascetic lying in the courtyard outside the church. He looked exhausted and was quite ill. This holy person had the gift of foresight. He lifted his eyes and out of all the company of girls standing by him, he looked at Maria. Come here, you. Go into the neighborhood and ask for a rag rug. Find a rock, too, and bring them to me. Maria willingly brought them to the elder. He was comforted and said to her, My child, I will give you three pieces of advice for you to put into practice. Pray the noetic prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, continually without ceasing. When you go out of your house and walk down the road, do not look left or right or up. Look only at the ground. Even though you are poor, my child, when a little money comes to you, break it into half dollars. Then when you find a beggar, give him charity so that you will, your half dollar, with your half dollar and a little charity from other Christians, he can buy some bread. End of quote. Maria thanked him, and when the pilgrimage was over, she returned to her home, holding in her heart the beneficial counsel she had received from that unknown holy ascetic. Despite her poverty, Maria always practiced almsgiving, a virtue she had received as a sacred trust from her father. After her blessed meeting with the saintly ascetic, she cultivated it to the extreme for the entirety of her life in the world and on into her monastic life. 4. German Occupation The God-loving Maria, now 19 years old, was striving more and more to experience true life in Christ 
with her spiritual sisters as co-strugglers. One time after the Divine Liturgy, on August 15th, 1940, footnote, August 15th is the feast of the Dormition of the Theotokos, and this date in 1940 marked the first day of Greek involvement in World War II, when the Italians bombed a Greek battleship that was transporting soldiers to the island of Tinos to participate in the feast. To continue, she and six other spiritual sisters received Andideron without having anything else to eat, went to light the oil lamps in the chapel of St. Nicholas of Crimastu in the neighborhood of St. Onufrius in Volos. When they got hungry on the way, Maria said with simplicity, wouldn't it be nice if we had a slice of bread and a little fig to eat? They reached the chapel and with great reverence began to chant and light the oil lamps. When Maria went to light the oil lamp in the holy altar, she saw a little package on the altar table. She took it in her hands and with great joy and said to the other girls that it was a gift from St. Nicholas. When they opened it, they found seven slices of warm bread and a fig for each of them. A month and a half later, they went to the chapel again, but this time in the holy altar. Maria saw blood mixed with water running from the immaculate side of Christ and the icon on the crucifix, as well as from the crown of thorns. She took some cotton and filled with awe, she carefully wiped the crucifix. When they left, they went straight to the church of St. Apostolos the New for Vespers, and they gave the saturated cotton to their spiritual father. He understood that it was a sign that war was near. He announced the incident in his homily and blessed all those in church with the cotton at the end of the service. It was the beginning of October of 1940, and indeed war was formally declared a few days later. The years of the German-Italian occupation were a martyrdom, and the Greek people suffered terribly from hunger. One day, Maria made the difficult decision to sell some of her mother's embroidery in the suburbs of Larissa in order to cover some of her needs. That night, she stayed in the home of a refugee family she knew. The room they had given her to rest in had a large opening under the door. Throughout the entire night, she heard a noise from the next room as if someone was doing prostrations. When she got up, she peered through the opening under the door and saw a nun praying, bathed in light. An inner voice informed, informed her that it was St. Periscavi. In the difficult times of pain and deprivation, God consoled her with such experiences of his grace. During the harsh period of the occupation, there were days when Maria did not even have a piece of bread to eat and reached the point of such exhaustion that she said to Christ, <clears throat> If it is your will, take me. Let me die. Outside her little house, a few greens were growing, which she picked every day to have something to eat. The next day, sometimes even the same day, other greens as big as the ones she had just picked would miraculously sprout up at the same spot. She lived from this miracle for six months. Sometimes she would wash them and take them to a young girl she was caring for who was sick with tuberculosis. The lack of essential food began to leave its mark on the young Maria. Little by little, she weakened, and hair like peach fuzz began to grow all over her skin, even on her face. From her great weakness, she reached the point where she had difficulty standing up and walking and she began dragging herself. But the Panagia, protectress of orphans, upon whom she constantly called, did not leave her without help. Maria's spiritual father realized her great deprivation, and as he delivered his homily to his parishioners, he strongly urged them to help the orphan, asking each of them to throw at least one bite of bread into Maria's window every day. After this, Maria gradually began to recover. At one time, it became necessary for Maria and two other girls to, to go to Zagora to seek help. They went to visit a family on the east side of Pelion who were friends of her parents. Maria hoped to give her father's old watch to his friends in exchange for a little food. She made the decision to part with this watch with pain in her soul as it was the last thing she had as a keepsake from her father. As soon as these people saw how emaciated Maria was, that she was almost a skeleton, they began to weep. That night when they offered her homemade bread, Maria was so hungry that she ate an entire loaf, 
as well as whatever else they gave her. Before the girls departed in the morning, the family gathered food to send home with them, and they gave a sack of potatoes and a small container of oil to Maria. However, she could not carry the load due to her weakness, and so she had some children with an animal help her up the hill to the road. On the way home, they continually came upon patrolling Italian soldiers. This delayed their return until after midnight. As soon as they saw the Italians, the girls would hide in the cliffs and pray, Thou art a rampart for virgins, O Theotokos and virgin, from the 19th oikos of the salutations to the all-holy Theotokos. The Italians, however, taking pity on their hardship, finally offered to help by carrying their load part of the way. Upon approaching her house after walking for six exhausting hours, Maria fainted, no longer able to endure. After some time when she regained consciousness, she realized that all her food was gone. She understood that someone had taken it, yet she was not upset because with the nobility of soul for which she was always distinguished, she presumed that the people who had taken the food were very hungry and had greater need of it. As a result of her many hardships, she began to feel a sharp pain in her side and had trouble breathing. With great effort, she went to the doctor. After he examined her, he diagnosed her with pleurisy. He advised her to buy some bran and heat it, then put it on her side as a compress in order to be cured. When she returned home, since it was not possible for her to buy bran, she warmed a piece of clay tile and placed it on the painful side of her back. Sitting in the dark without even an oil lamp, she was praying to the Panagia and waiting peacefully for her end. At one moment, her dark room lit up and she beheld a nun approaching who had a red cross stitched on her head covering and was wearing the monastic schema. With much love, the nun asked her, Are you ill? Maria answered that she did not feel well and she complained about the loss of the provisions given to her. The nun consoled Maria, telling her that she would be healed, not to worry. The nun then made the sign of the cross over her and covered her with a blanket, the only thing Maria had kept from her mother. She tucked her in on both sides, saying tenderly that these, that there was nothing seriously wrong and very soon she would be completely well. Immediately the pain and exhaustion subsided. The feeling of hunger disappeared and she felt satiated. Her cousin, who lived across the street, visited her the next morning and inquired about the light that was shining through Maria's window all night. Maria did not reveal to her what had happened. She decided to visit the doctor again to have him listen to her lungs. He scolded her for returning so quickly, but he examined her and, to his great surprise, discovered that her fever was gone and her back, which had been bruised from falling when she lost consciousness the day before, was now healed. She was indeed completely healthy. When Maria wondered who the nun was who healed her, she heard an inner voice say that it was St. Perscavi. Despite the hardships of the occupation, Blessed Maria never neglected her spiritual work or attending church. With willingness and self-sacrifice, she always helped anyone who was in need. Even though she worked nine to ten hours a day, she would still wake up every day at three in the morning and walk an hour to church. One time as she was walking to church, a German sh soldier stopped her for being out past curfew. When he was about to seize her, she lifted up her arms, making the sign of the cross over herself three times while saying that she was going to church. When the German saw her cross herself, not only did he not arrest her, but he did not hinder her at all from reaching her destination. Another time during the occupation, when it was nearing curfew, her spiritual father suddenly remembered that he had a meeting with someone about a serious matter. He had forgotten about it, and now it was too late. There was not enough time to get there before curfew. Maria, seeing his dilemma, willingly offered to go herself in order to notify the man. She asked only that he pray for her and bless her with the sign of the cross. Maria ran without losing her breath and felt that she was not touching the ground, as if two hands were pushing her. In a flash, she completed her mission, having faith in the prayers and blessings of her spiritual father. Though normally it was a 30-minute distance, she returned safely to her spiritual father within 10 minutes. Immediately after that, she ran home in the same manner, and as soon as she arrived and locked the door behind her, she heard machine guns firing. 
Maria's greatest concern was always for her brother, and even more so during the years of the war and the occupation. When George first moved to Athens, Maria supported him financially, depriving herself of even the most basic necessities. One year during Great Lent, she reached the point of eating only bread and water. She also had a debt she owed for some medications, which she had to pay off by Pascha. Due to her extreme weakness, Maria was afraid she would not be able to attend the service of the resurrection. Her deprivation was so great that she did not even have money to buy a Paschal candle. Holy Saturday arrived and she went to church and was praying to the Lord using her prayer rope, timidly complaining that on such an important day, she did not even have a candle to bring forward at the hymn, Come, receive the light. Seeing her so sorrowful, a lady approached her and asked if she needed anything. Maria asked if she would buy her a candle, saying that she would repay her as soon as she was able. At the moment when the priest read the resurrection gospel, quote, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, John 1.1. 1, 1. She heard it so loudly, she would later narrate as if all the radios in the world were broadcasting it. From this intense experience of divine grace, she lost consciousness, and when she came to, these words remained branded in her soul, giving her a feeling of divine satiation. Throughout the entire Pascha service, she heard these words over and over again while experiencing an inexpressibly sweet taste. An ineffable fragrance penetrated her entire being. Immediately, her hunger and physical exhaustion subsided. In later years, Eurondissa would describe with great humility this spiritual state that she experienced as a gift from God, who sweetens and consoles those in great deprivation and poverty with His grace. During these difficult years of the occupation, Maria had the blessing to meet several virtuous and God-gifted people in Athens when she went to visit her brother. One such visit, she had heard of a very ascetic elder with the gift of foresight who lived in a secluded area of Caminia in Piraeus. One morning, without having eaten anything, she crossed herself and set out to find him. She had no knowledge of his address, nor did she have anyone to guide her. Once it became dark, she began to worry. She knocked on the door of a small house nearby to ask for help, and immediately the reverend elder whom she was seeking answered the door. The God-gifted elder welcomed her and invited her in, saying that he had been waiting for her all day. With fatherly love, he gave her something to eat and counseled her, at the same time revealing to her many things about her life. Deeply benefited, Maria took his blessing and left with great joy. In another area of Athens, there lived a pious elderly woman named Nicoleta, who was originally from Asia Minor. Eurondisa Nicoleta had a miraculous icon of the Panagia from which at times a knocking sound could be heard, and then the image of the Theotokos would disappear. The Panagia would miraculously come out of the icon and appear to people as a nun, and after some time would return. The same knocking sound would be heard once more, and her image would reappear again on the icon. Many people asked the old woman for the icon, but she would not give it to anyone. When Maria heard about the miracles that this icon performed for the faithful, she de decided to visit Yorondas and Nicoleta in order to take her blessing and venerate the icon. When she confided in the Yorondasa about her monastic calling, she looked at Maria intently and said to her, I will give the icon to you. Take it. Upon receiving it, Maria promised that she would pray for her always, and after the Yorondasa departed from this life, she would take care of all the memorial services for the repose of her soul. As Maria grew in age and virtue, so her love for Christ also increased. The divine yearning to be worthy one day to venerate the Holy Land, where the God-man walked, was cultivated in her soul. Due to her poverty, she knew that it would be extremely difficult for this pilgrimage to become a reality. But eventually, the opportunity arose for her to go to Jerusalem with three women she knew. Because she sent all her money to her brother to cover his rent, she decided to borrow money for the expense of the trip. But as she considered her brother's financial difficulties, she decided to cancel her pilgrimage and returned the money she had borrowed, explaining the reason. During the time her acquaintances were on their pilgrimage, and Maria remained home, she saw her guardian angel 
in a vision, and he said to her, Come, let us go to the Holy Land. While Maria wondered how this could possibly happen, he took her by the hand, and she found herself with him in the Holy Land. As her angel guided her through all the holy sites, she saw that she was wearing a white gown decorated with red crosses like a baptismal garment. He took her first to Nazareth to venerate the Holy Church of the Annunciation of the Theotokos. The angel explained, saying, Come and see, sister. Here, Christ was made flesh. And he chanted the Apolichnikon for the Annunciation. Today is the prelude of our salvation. Then he took her to Bethlehem. They descended the stairs that led to the cave of the Nativity of Christ. And the angel said, Come and see, sister. Here, Christ was born and he chanted the Apolipticon, Thy Nativity, O Christ our God. Following this was Holy Golgotha, Come and see, sister, here, Christ was crucified. And again the angel chanted, You ransomed us from the curse of the law. He then guided her to the Holy Sepulcher, Come and see, sister, here, Christ was buried and resurrected. And again he chanted the Apolipticon, Christ is risen. The movement from one holy site to the other happened very quickly, as if there were no distance between them. Everything that Maria beheld was engraved deeply into her soul. Throughout their pilgrimage to the Holy Land, the three ladies saw Maria walking ahead of them at every holy site. When they returned to Volos and saw her, they complained to her that she had hidden from them the fact that she was going to go to Jerusalem. Seeing her sacrificial and merciful intentions, Divine Providence took her there in a spiritual way, thus fulfilling her fervent zeal and desire for the all-holy pilgrimage. Years later, Eurondisa related that when she visited the Holy Land with some of her synodia in 1971, she remembered everything in great detail. Even though it was her first visit there, she knew the way to each holy site, and she walked through the area with such ease and familiarity that it amazed the sisters. During this trip, out of her deep love for Christ, Eurondisa desired to leave her soul at his holy tomb and holy Golgotha. She wanted to offer something especially worthy as a sacrifice to God, even the shedding of her own blood. During the pilgrimage through the land where God himself walked, Eurondisa Macrina became ill with acute inflammation of the lungs and constantly coughed up blood. The doctor who examined her diagnosed her condition as extremely severe and was una unable to provide any remedy. Only God could heal her with a miracle. At this time, the chandelier in the church at the monastery in Portaria fell to the ground, and the sisters who had remained behind wondered if Eurondisa and the sisters in Jerusalem were in danger. Eurondisa, however, maintained a firm hope and assurance in her soul that she would not die. She strongly felt the grace of God. Although she in fact regained her health, through her illness, her holy desire to honor the venerable passion of our Lord with the humble sacrifice of her own blood became a reality. Throughout that pilgrimage, she felt a strong divine transformation, as if venerating the actual pure wounds of Christ and his holy blood. Due to her great reverence and faith, Eurondisa was made worthy to visit Jerusalem four times with sisters from the monastery up until 1980. 5. The Founding of the Holy Monastery and Her Monastic Tonsure From the time that Maria lived in the world, she regularly corresponded with Yeren de Yosif the Hezekist. Once, a spiritual sister of Maria's named Fotini ordered two wooden crosses from Yeren de Yosif. When three acquaintances from Volos visited the elder on Manathos, he gave them the crosses before they could even ask for them, and told them that Maria would be tonsured and Fotini would follow the married life. This prophecy of Yerunder Yosif became a reality. In 1954, five of the seven spiritual sisters who had bonded with Maria and were living as nuns in the world decided to settle somewhere together temporarily. During their efforts to find a place to live, they received a letter from the blessed Yerunder Yosif telling them that they would search out many places seeking the appropriate location, but in the end, they would settle not far from Volos. Yeranda Yosif described in detail how after ascending a steep path, they would pass a little chapel. Beyond a village, they would find a simple house to begin their monastic life together, and God would bless 
what followed. Truly, the new informal sisterhood found a house in the village of Stagiatis in Pelion and stayed there temporarily. These first sisters who came together later received monastic tonsures, taking the names Synclitiki, Ephraimia, Athanasia, Arsenia, and Melania. About three years later, Sister Christonymphi and Maria joined them. Yet under Yosef, the Hezekist undertook the spiritual guidance of this sisterhood for seven years until his blessed departure from this life on the Feast of the Dormition in 1959. The spiritual bond between the sisterhood and Yaranda Yosef was unbreakable. He followed their progress with great care and assiduous prayers, rejoicing because they made diligent efforts, especially in obedience, vigil, and the prayer. The grace of God revealed to Yaranda Yosef the spiritual progress of each sister. He would often describe his own spiritual states to them in his letters, greatly benefiting and motivating them toward greater spiritual struggles. During the first years of the newly established sisterhood, Maria continued to work, completing the years required to receive a pension that would be of help to the monastery where they would eventually settle permanently. She continued to live in Nia Ionia and would travel four and a half miles back and forth by foot to the village of Stagiatis. Because she did not want the sisters to have to go out into the world to deal with worldly affairs, she would take their handiwork and sell it for them. On returning home from this task one day, she was carrying a load of groceries weighing about 65 pounds and was extremely exhausted. However, instead of resting after a long day of labor, as soon as she arrived at the house, she left the groceries with the sisters and immediately did 400 prostrations and her prayer rule. Footnote, Maria's monastic prayer rule consisted of four 300 knot prayer ropes, making the sign of the cross on each knot while reciting the prayer. To continue, as she would later relate, she felt so much grace and divine eros that it was impossible to describe. Because of this, she would always teach that in toil one finds God. At the age of 36, three years after the establishment of the informal community, having com completed her duties in the world, Maria went to live permanently with the sisterhood. Soon, Jan and Defrem's mother, Victoria, also joined them. The sisters then needed to decide on an abbess to whom they would show obedience. Maria was distinguished for her virtue, but there were sisters older than she was. They turned to Yerande Yosef the Hezekist through a letter requesting that he pray about the matter. After a short time, Yerande Yosef, having seen a vision during his prayer, wrote to them, quote, God has chosen Maria, the good portion. See Luke 10.42. In the vision, he saw a lush green meadow with Maria in the middle and little sheep all around her. At one point, an ape appeared and tried to bother the sheep, but Maria, with her staff in hand, chased it far away. Out of deep humility, Maria had difficulty accepting the position of abbess. Yet under Yosef then began to pray and ask God to reveal his will to Maria. Truly, one night, Maria saw in a vision the honorable forerunner and Baptist John ascending toward heaven, bearing a staff in his hand. She followed him. Behind her was a multitude of nuns, which Maria was trying to gather. At one moment, the holy foreigner paused, turned toward Maria, and placed the staff in her hands. After this vision, Maria accepted the shepherding of the sisterhood as the will of God. With the undertaking of her new duty, Yorondisa increased her struggles and labors for the love of Christ and for the souls which the Lord had entrusted to her disregarding the threat of her fragile health. For instance, on one occasion after very toilsome labor, she suffered significant respiratory hemorrhaging, causing her to cough up blood and placing her life in peril. In her exhaustion, she felt her soul ascending while seeing her body lie motionless. While her eyes were closed, she beheld the souls of departed people whom she had known since she was five years old. She found herself in a place of blessedness, and she realized that in this place, souls knew one another and communicated with each other. The sisters did not inform Yerunda Yosef of Yerundus's condition promptly because there was no method of direct communication with him. After a few days, however, a letter arrived from Yerunda stating that he and his co-ascetic, Father Arsenios, had received a revelation that Yerundus was seriously ill, and they had intensified their prayers for the recovery of her health. 
Eurondissa also saw the two elders at her bedside every night, praying with their prayer ropes, Lord Jesus Christ, heal thy servant, and crossing themselves with every knot. When the sisters began to consider where to permanently establish the holy monastery, Yerande Yosif recommended they go to Agina to find Yerande Eronimos of Cappadocia, who lived from 1883 to 1966, to seek his advice. He was a man of noetic prayer, an ascetic spirit who experienced such high spiritual states that one time during the divine liturgy, he even saw the lamb as the divine infant calling him to dismember him. Footnote, this refers to the service of the Holy Proscomity when the priest cuts into the lamb in the prosphora seal. Continuing. In obedience to Yana and Yosif, Yurondesa and Sister Sinkliti went to Agina on behalf of the entire sisterhood to meet Yeranda Euronimos. When they arrived, Yerondesa Ephraxia, who cared for Yeranda Euronimos, received them. She was the sister according to the flesh of Yeranda Arsenios, the co-ascetic of Yeranda Yosif the Hesychist. In the beginning, Yeranda Euronimos tested their patience and humility, and then he received them. He blessed them and said that he would always follow their progress noetically and pray for the sisterhood. He described to them in detail how the monastery would be built on a mountainside next to a ravine. Comforted by this blessed meeting, the sisters returned with joy and began little by little to look for the place to establish the holy monastery. Approaching the end of his life, Yeranda Yosif the Hezekis gathered the fathers of his synodia to leave with them his last spiritual directions and orders as a sacred inheritance. He indicated which members of their small brotherhood would establish new monastic communities and which of the remaining fathers would follow each one of them. To the future Yerande Ephrem, he foretold that he would become an abbot, even though he was drawn to the hesychistic and ascetical life of the Athenite desert. Yerande Yosif asked him to take father Athanasios, the elder's brother according to the flesh, and the novice Timothy Papa Constantinitu, later Hiramonk Yosif, describing him characteristically, keep him, he has fear of God and spiritual forcefulness. This father Yosif, originally from Pletu in the region of Amniovolos, was later the, the, the liturgist of the Eurondas of Macrina's monastery for over 20 years until his falling asleep on December 22, 2003. Finally, Yeranda Yosif the Hezekist entrusted to the future Yeranda Ephraim the task of continuing correspondence with the sisters and assuming the spiritual guidance of the sisterhood in Volos as he himself had done previously. In 1962, a piece of property with a small building was purchased in the village of Portaria in Pelion where the monastery would be built. When the construction first began, Yorondesa asked Sister Ephraimia to bring the miracle-working icon of the Theotokos by foot from Stagiatis. Sick with a fever, the sister hesitated to carry the icon up the steep cobblestone road. Eurondas assured her that she would pray for her and she would not have difficulty at all. Truly, Sister Ephraimia did not feel the weight of the icon the entire distance she carried it, even though it was placed with a heavy silver covering. Instead, she felt that the icon was very light and that she was scarcely touching it. In this way, the Panagia showed that she was pleased with her new home. From then on, the miraculous icon stayed at the construction site of the new monastery. One night, two men from the neighboring village, gentlemen Socrates K and, and Nestor A, beheld a bright pillar of light descending from the heavens and shining down upon the location where the monastery was being built. The next day, they went to this area to see exactly what was happening. When they met the sisters, they related the miracle they had seen the night before and discovered that the icon of the Panagia was situated at the very spot they indicated. In 1963, the construction of the holy monastery of Panagia, Odigritria, was complete and the property appropriately prepared so that the new sisterhood could take up residence there. Soon after this, Yeranda Frem tonsured his mother, Victoria, giving her the name Theophano. Maria's tonsure followed, and she was given the monastic name of St. Macrina, the sister of St. Basil the Great. Eurondesa Theophano, whom Eurondesa Macrina honored throughout her monastic life, served as her sponsor. 
The tonsuring took place during the service of Compline. Yorondasa beheld a light as if the sun were arising from the holy altar of the church, illuminating everything as it were daytime. She was in a state of theoria, and she beheld Christ crucified and his immaculate blood flowing from his wounds into her heart. For forty days her mind was full of light and joy, and she shed endless tears. Her radiant spiritual state affected all those around her. Because of this spiritual transformation, Yorondasa desired to go up to a high mountain top, as she would later say many times, and proclaim the grandeur of God, crying out for all people to become monastics in order to glorify God. Throughout the first days of her tonsure, after her tonsure, whenever she saw the icon of the last judgment outside her cell, she would go into Theoria as if she were in the flames of hell. This transformation from the grace of the great and angelic schema lasted for some time. For many days she did not want to taste any food, and for an entire year she was not occupied by any earthly thoughts. 6. Virtues and Spiritual Experiences in the Monastic Arena Yoronda Samakrina was adorned with an abundance of virtues, which sprang forth from her Christ-centered life and her genuine ascetic conduct. She was especially distinguished for her warm-hearted hospitality and charity. In different ways, she discreetly helped and supported many suffering brethren who were in trouble and in need. She continuously counseled the sisters concerning charity. Quote, the Panagia will not abandon us. You give one, and when you have faith, the Panagia gives back ten. Whatever we give from the Panagia's home is a blessing from the Panagia. This is why the grace of Our Lady Theotokos strengthens us and helps us. End of quote. Whenever the sisters made fresh homemade bread, it was Yorondasa Makrina's great joy to give it out as a blessing. One time, a family came for Vespers for Cheese Fair Sunday, also called Forgiveness Sunday. And when Yorondasa was seeing them off, she told one of the nuns to give them a loaf of bread, even though a sister had already told her it was the last loaf and there was no time to make more since clean week was beginning. Yorondasa entirely trusted that the Panagia would provide for her monastery and so the last loaf was given away. After Compline that evening, when the monastery gate had already been locked for the night, someone came and rang the bell persistently. It was a baker known to the monastery. He had brought a carload of fresh bread. It was such a large amount that the sisters made rusks with it and ate them throughout the duration of that year's great Lent. Eurondus's virtue of hospitality showed forth when a pious hero monk visited the monastery with 50 pilgrims from Harleos, a suburb of Thessaloniki. They asked to stay the night so that they could attend the Sunday Divine Liturgy the next morning. Anyone else would have thought it impossible to host so many people, but Eurondasa took care to offer them food and improvised accommodations in three rooms, the only rooms available where they could rest. Eurondasa was sorry that they did not have the ability to host the pilgrims as comfortably as she wanted, so she kept vigil all night in order to take part in their discomfort. When they went to the Divine Liturgy in the morning, the priest with the pilgrims hastened to thank Yorondasa, who, as they said, was vigilant all night long, ceaselessly passing among them, covering them so that they would not be cold. Yorondasa, however, informed them that she had not left her cell all night, and they realized that it was a miracle of the Panagia Odegrutria, before leaving that afternoon, they served the Paraclesis to honor the Most Holy Theotokos. A certain sister also related that she had seen the Panagia enter her cell that night, even though her door was locked. The Panagia approached both her and the other sister who were sleeping in that cell and said, Oh, these are my girls. Yorondasa Makrina also had the gift of prayer, which she had embraced from childhood. Her soul found rest in prayer, and in prayer, she entrusted all of her requests to God. One time she entreated God with tears to show her how she sh should pray so that her prayer would be pure and free from conceit. And thus with unhindered prayer she could be united with him. That night an angel of the Lord appeared to her clothed all in white and taught her how a person should pray depending on his spiritual state. According to what the angel showed her, when the soul feels perfect love for God, a person raises his hands high. 
When humility and remembrance of the passion of Christ take hold, a person crosses his arms and bows his head. When the soul feels extreme humility for the war of the passions, then a person prays with his hands behind his back like a convict. The angel then began to pray on his knees and to weep as if he were embracing the feet of Christ, showing how a person prays when he perceives his nothingness, and in this way he experiences inexpressible joy and consolation from God. A giant ladder then appeared in the air, the steps of which were very far apart. The angel told her to follow him, and holding her by the hand, they began to ascend. Little by little, a thick black tangible darkness, smelling like sulfur, engulfed them. As they ascended, it became more and more difficult for Eurondasa to breathe. They finally arrived at the prisons where the people with mortal sins were kept. In that inconsolable place of deep darkness, the moaning of the lost souls resonated, and the sight was horrifying. Lamenting and groaning echoed everywhere. For the rest of her life, Eurondasa could never forget that lamentation. When she came to herself after living that experience, she was overcome with weeping. For ten days, she could not hold back her tears. On the one hand, she felt joy from the angelic presence and his teaching on prayer. On the other hand, she felt mourning for the dreadful vision. Following that visitation, she experienced even more compunction in her prayer. She had no sense of time and shed abundant tears. Living hesychastically and practicing the prayer unceasingly, Yorondasa Makrina prayed for all people, especially for those she had known while living in the world. With great pain, she pleaded for the salvation of the souls of the departed who had not confessed, primarily their deadly sins. In one such case, she also requested others to pray for the repose of the soul of Glykyria, an acquaintance of hers from her youth. Glykyria could not withstand the hunger during the German occupation, and in order to survive, she began to make concessions until little by little she ended up in sin. With great sorrow, Eurondasa wondered about the condition of Glykikiria's departed soul. One night after intense prayer, she saw a fiery river, and in the middle of the river, she saw Glykikiria on a raft. She was calling out to Eurondasa, begging her for her prayers and help. Help me, Eurondasa, I am burning. This image of Hades in Glykikiria's desperate cries never left Eurondasa's mind and compelled her to pray with greater pain of soul and contrition for the repose of souls who departed this world without confession and unprepared to meet God. Eurondasa's continual concern and fervent desire was the salvation of all mankind and foremost her sisterhood. In order to carry out the ministry of governing the sisterhood, she asked God to grant her experiences so she would not be teaching only from books but also from her personal experience. In this way, her words would have greater effect on the sister's souls. And the Lord granted her spiritual perception, teaching her with divine visions and heavenly experiences. Once during the Cheryubic hymn on the Feast of Palm Sunday, this took place sometime around 1985, while Eurondasa was kneeling in front of her stasidi, she found herself noetically inside the holy sanctuary. She saw that the holy proskomedi was covered with a deep red material like velvet. On top of it was the holy chalice, and all around it were tongues of flame. In each fiery tongue she beheld scenes from the passion of Christ through his resurrection. As Eurondasa gazed in awe, a light with blinding brilliance poured out from the holy chalice, and for a few minutes she thought she had lost her sight. This experience of the uncreated light granted Eurondasa even greater precision and devotion toward the awesome mystery of the Divine Eucharist. Eurondasa Makrina had great reverence for St. Ephraim the Syrian, the saint of tears, and she regularly studied and delighted in his ascetical works. One day the saint appeared in her cell as an ascetical elder wearing the angelic schema and carrying a sack over his shoulder. He introduced himself and called her to approach him. He blessed her, kissed her head, and disappeared. Immediately, Eurondasa felt like a young child, and she sensed a blessed warmth upon her face. Her joy lasted for many days. 
In addition to her own personal experiences, Eurondissa sought with pious discretion to learn of the spiritual experiences of other people, especially priests, in order to benefit herself and in turn to instruct the sisterhood. In her homilies to the sisters, she spoke with great awe and fear of God about the exceedingly great value of the divine liturgy. She would often say that the divine mystery cannot be compared with anything earthly. Moved by her deep reverence for the highest ministry of the priesthood, Eurondissa would ask any visiting priest what he experienced during the divine liturgy. Once, the blessed Yeronda Gabriel, who lived from 1910 to 1994, of the Holy Monastery of the Transfiguration and Flarmurios Magnesia, visited the monastery. When Eurondissa asked him about the spiritual states that God grants during the divine liturgy and especially about the vision of angels, Yeronda Gabriel answered with simplicity, quote, How can we speak of these things, Yeronda? You cannot understand. Our tongues cannot speak such things. We cannot describe it. It is something heavenly. Oh, what happens during the divine liturgy? Angels, archangels. The church fills with more angels than the number of our breaths. End quote. Continuing, the reverend elder wept with compunction and added that experiencing a vision of the Panagia is incomparably greater than the vision of the divine bodiless powers. With great faith and fervent prayers, Yorondasa never relaxed her vigilance, but unceasingly agonized over the spiritual progress and the salvation of the sisterhood. Night and day, she implored the Panagia for all the souls that she was responsible for, and the Panagia did not deprive her of her consolation and visitation. One time, during the Cheyubic hymn in the Divine Liturgy, while Yorondasa was kneeling and overcome with this anguish, she beheld the Panagia as a 15-year-old girl standing in the royal doors, her face bathed in otherworldly light. Just as in the icon of the lady quick to hear in Eurondas's cell, the Panagia held Christ as an infant. Eurondas expressed her agony over the salvation of the sisterhood, and the Panagia smiled at her, immediately granting her a deep peace. The Most Holy Theotokos also guided her concerning practical matters and tasks of the monastery, one time, Eurondissa saw the Panagia in the kitchen showing her how to work, putting away dishes and tidying up the space in the blink of an eye. Because of this experience, Eurondissa would often say that the Panagia is a very good housekeeper and very quick, and she would urge the sisters to work carefully and quickly. Another time, as she was walking toward the chapel of the Panagia, Odigrutria, to, to do her rule of prayer, she saw the Panagia as a nun showing her how to perform her rule. With her strong, zealous, and compunctionate voice, Yorondissa greatly loved to chant hymns to Christ in the Panagia. She loved the dogmatic Theotokia from the Octikos and the Apolitikia to the saints. She especially loved to chant the Troparion, I desire Panagia, the beauty of paradise, the sweet smells and the blossoms, the pleasant fragrance and the voices of the angels when they hymn the master. End quote, a hymn from the great Paraclesis. To continue, she would also be moved to deep compunction by the great Prochimenon, what God is as great as our God, as well as the doxastisicticon and the aposticon from the Vespers of Holy Friday, quote, thou who covers thyself with light as with a garment which she would always ask to have chanted for her by any chanters who visited the monastery. When Eurondissa chanted, her face was illumined by the lofty meaning within the theology of the hymns because she mystically experienced them at the time of the Divine Liturgy and in her personal prayers. 7. Eurondissa's Acquaintance with Holy Contemporary Figures of Orthodox Monasticism Throughout her years as abbess, our Yorondissa closely followed the tradition of the Holy Fathers preserved in the narrations from the Yorondikon that say to emulate each other for spiritual benefit. Thus, with great zeal, she would visit contemporary monastic figures who were distinguished for their God-inspired and unerring teachings, as well as for their holiness of life. After 1967, 
Yorondesa and several of the nuns visited the holy monastery of the Panagia in Klesura of Katsroya to receive the blessing and prayers of the holy ascetic Yorondesa Sophia Hotoku Kurudu, who lived from 1883 to 1974. Yorondesa Sophia was recently glorified as a saint by our Holy Orthodox Church, with May 6 as her appointed feast day. Living in continual communion with the Panagia, Saint Sophia gave herself over to superhuman asceticism while pretending to be a fool for Christ's sake. Footnote, fools for Christ feign madness to conceal holiness and to bring scorn upon themselves, thereby cultivating humility. Foolishness for Christ is a rare spiritual gift granted to a very few. To continue, she would admonish all who visited her, especially young people, to give great attention to the subject of purity. Through all of her hardships and asceticism, the Holy Spirit granted her the gift of clairvoyance, foresight, and miracle working. Saint Sophia received Eurondesa Macrina with great love and advised her regarding the spiritual struggle, monastic life, and shepherding the souls who come to the monastery. She advised Eurondesa to admonish everyone to make sincere confessions. Quote, you have a monastery, and you will give an account to God if people visit and you do not speak to them about how to know Christ. You will tell them that in the same way they clean their houses in the corners and cracks and throw out the garbage, so must they clean their souls. They should make sincere confessions to clean the house of their souls. End of quote. To strengthen the faith of those present at that blessed visit, she told them of the miraculous surgical procedure that the Panagia and the saints did for her in September of 1967. She showed them with her holy simplicity the scar in the form of a cross on her body. Yoronisa Macrina had a shawl with her, and as they left, she placed it with reverence over the extremely hunched back of the saint, who was comforted and blessed her, saying, just as you covered me, likewise may your angel cover you, and may the Panagia cover you with her protection. Eurondesa frequently used St. Sophia's teachings when advising pilgrims. During that same time, after 1967, the blessed Yeronda Philotheus Zervakos, who lived from 1884 to 1980, visited the monastery twice when his pastoral ministry brought him to the area. The monastery gave him the warmest reception and hospitality. Eurondas spoke with him at length and was benefited by his grace-filled words and his spiritual experiences. Eurondas also greatly honored Father Athanasios Mytilineos, who lived 1927 to 2006, from the holy monastery of Komenai of Stominu in Larissa for his spirituality and his theological and dogmatic knowledge. She visited him in 1979 to receive his blessing. Father Athanasios' spiritual children brought his recorded homilies as a blessing to the monastery, which Eurondesa would often use in the sisters' gatherings. She held him in high regard for his great contribution to the Orthodox Church and would often say how the blessed Father Athanasios spared no labor or pain, limiting his personal rest to a minimum in order to minister the divine word. In September to October of 1981, Yeronda Ephraim of Katonakia, who lived 1912 to 1998, a blessed disciple of Yeronda Yosif the Hezekist, stayed in a hospital for clergy in Athens for one month, undergoing treatment for a skin disease on his legs, from which he had suffered for many years. His hospitalization became known in spiritual circles. Since the elder did not otherwise leave the holy mountain, many monastic communities, including women's monasteries, rushed to visit him and receive his teachings and blessings. Yaranda Ephraim was accompanied by his first disciple, the hero monk Yosif, who attended to him during his treatment, serving also as the doorkeeper of his room in order to preserve quiet for the patient. Footnote on Hero Monk Yosif. Hero Monk Yosif is Yeranda Ephraim's successor at the sacred Hezekasterion of St. Ephraim the Syrian in Katanakia in the desert of Manathos. To continue, 
Yoranda and Makrina went to the hospital together with some other sisters and approaching Father Yosif in the hallway, they asked permission to see the elder. Father Yosif went into the room and informed his elder of the arrival of Yoranda and Makrina and her nuns. The elder's answer was emphatic. Open the doors wide, my child. Yorondasa went in with great reverence towards the elder and with evident love and emotion. After taking the elder's blessing, they departed. Yorondasa's conduct made an impression on Father Yosif, as did the joy that he saw in his elder's face. Thus, when they returned to their skeet on Manathos, he asked his elder where that mutual esteem derived from. The elder narrated how he met Yorondasa Makrina for the first time in 1974 in Thessaloniki when she visited him again in the hospital with her sisterhood. That time the elder was away from Manathos for the first time after 38 years because of cyanosis, an illness caused by poisoning. Yorondas's modest appearance and monastic manners had made an impression on him. Returning to his cell, he fervently prayed for Yorondasa and received a revelation that Yorondasa Makrina was at the same great spiritual height as the blessed Yeranda Yosif the Hezekist. Another time, when Yeranda Ephrem of Katanakia was praying for Yorondasa and her sisterhood, he saw two brilliant pillars above her monastery. In a spiritual manner, he was seeing the prayers of Yorondasa Makrina and Yorondasa Theophano. In July of 1990, a pilgrim going to Mount Athos passed by the monastery to speak with Yorondasa. When Yorondasa learned that he would be visiting Yeranda Ephrem of Katanakia, she sent a small gift of some nuts with him for the elder. The elder received the gift with great joy and a wide smile. That Yorondasa, my child, is all fragrance, he told the pilgrim, referring to the purity of her heart. Yorondasa Makrina also had great reverence for two other contemporary holy, holy elders, St. Porfirios Kavsokalidis, who lived 1906 to 1991, and St. Paisios the Athenite, who lived from 1924 to 1994. Footnote, both of these holy elders have been glorified as saints of the Orthodox Church since this book was first written. She visited St. Porfirios in 1984 in Athens with the purpose of asking him to bless her hand, which had been injured from a fracture, so she could avoid having surgery that would be dangerous due to her diabetes. Instead of addressing the issue of her hand, the saint only asked for the names of her sisterhood. As Euronus had named the nuns, St. Porfirios, with his gift of clairvoyance, revealed the spiritual state of each sister as she was being named. In the winter of 1986, accompanied by Yorondasa Fevronia. Footnote, Yorondasa Fevronia is the abbess of the Holy Monastery, the honorable forerunner in Ceres, Greece. To continue, <clears throat> Yorondasa Fevronia and the other nuns, Yorondasa Macrina, visited the Holy Monastery of St. John the Forerunner in Metamorphosi, of Chalkidiki to take the blessing of St. Paisios the Athenite. As soon as they met, Yorondasa Makrina made a full prostration to the saint, and he immediately did the same. St. Paisios would not get up if Yorondasa did not get up first. They had spiritual unity, and they could each sense the spiritual state of the other. The humility of St. Paisios was evident above all from the words he said a few moments later, referring to Yeronda Ephrem. Quote, why did you come to me? You have the first prize. What can I tell you? You have the admonitions of your Yeronda. End quote. Yerondasa Makrina also had great reverence for the blessed St. Yakovo Salikis, who lived from 1910 to 1991. St. Yakovo Salikis was canonized a saint of the Orthodox Church on November 27th, 2017. To continue whom she visited at the Holy Monastery of St. David in Limni of Evia in 1988 and 1990. During the first visit, the Blessed Elder was very ill. In addition to his other illnesses, he suffered greatly from vertigo and did not go down for the Divine Liturgy that day. The fathers of the monastery told the sisters it would be impossible for him to see them. With unshakable faith and boldness, Eurondas said, Pray with your prayer ropes, the elder will come and give us his blessing. Finally, 
Father Kiel, Kirill, the future abbot of the monastery, told the elder that Yorondasa Macrina and her sisterhood were waiting for him. With great effort, but also with tremendous joy, St. Yakovos came down and welcomed the sisters, admonishing them for a long time while standing. At one point, addressing the lay people also present, he said, quote, If I were in your place, I would go by foot to the monastery every morning to receive the blessing of Yorondasa Macrina, and then I would go to my work. End of quote. Finally, bidding the sisterhood farewell from the gate as they got on the bus to leave, he chanted, Adam sat across from paradise and lamented. A footnote from the Doxa, Stikon chanted in great vespers of Cheese Fair Sunday, commemorating the casting out of Adam from paradise. The elder chanted this to express the great loss he felt at Yorondas' departure, so great that his sorrow was equal to that of Adam at his exile. To continue, during their second visit to the Holy Monastery of St. David in the summer of 1990, St. Yakovos received the sisterhood with evident reverence towards Yorondasa, saying, Yorondasa Makrina is not only your mother, she is our mother too, and the mother of the entire church. So great is my reverence and respect for Yorondasa Makrina that if I were in Volos, I would go every morning to kiss her hand. Every morning during the Divine Liturgy, we take out a portion for Yorunda Samakrina and her sisterhood. That portion is taken by an angel of the Lord, and we believe this, and he takes it to the throne of God. We pray for all souls, for Yorunda Samakrina, for the nuns, for all people, for good health, for those who are suffering, and for sinners. God gives his blessing. End of quote. The saint blessed Yorondasa personally, saying, May he give you as much health as he wills until your time is finished. May God grant you good paradise. My Yorondasa, may you be numbered with your blessed sisterhood among the wise virgins. St. Yakovo spoke at length with Yorondasa about his miraculous spiritual experiences and states of divine grace. When the sisters were leaving and asked for his blessing, he blessed them with a cross that Yorondas had sent him as a gift. 8. Mother of the Church The grace of God and her personal spiritual struggle for the perfection of her soul made Yorondas and Macrina truly worthy to be distinguished as a mother not only to the sisterhood, but as mother of the Church, as the discerning St. Yaakov stated. The holy monastery of Panagia Orugutria flourished under the illumined guidance of Yorondasa Makrina and by God's providence. In time, it became the divine nursery from which other holy monasteries in Greece, the United States, and Canada were founded or reestablished. First, in 1974, the holy monastery of the Archangel Michael in Thassos was reestablished as a matokion of the monastery of Philotheu on Manathos. Twelve years later, in 1986, a monastic synodia was sent to the Holy Monastery of the Honorable Forerunner in Ceres. Later, in 1995, the Holy Monast Monastery of the Honorable Forerunner in Naosu was reestablished, and in 1996, the Holy Monastery of Panagia Glicophilusa was founded in Rapsani in of Larissa. All of these monasteries were populated by nuns from Yorondasa Macrina's monastery and Portaria. With the blessing of the Greek Archdiocese of America and the Metropolis of Canada, Greek Orthodox monasteries were founded in the United States and Canada under the spiritual guidance of Yeranda Ephrem of Philotheu Monastery. In 1989, nuns from Portaria founded the first monastery, the Holy Monastery of the Nativity of the Theotokos in Saxonburg, Pennsylvania. Then, in 1995, the Holy Monastery of the Honorable Forerunner was established in Goldendale, Washington. Also, two sister monasteries in Greece, the Holy Monastery of the Archangel Michael in Thassos and the Holy Monastery of the Honorable Forerunner in Ceres, were counted worthy to contribute new monastic sisterhoods to Greece as well as to North America, each formed by a nucleus of nuns who began their monastic journey at the mon holy monastery of Panagia Odrytria. 
As a most blessed spiritual mother, Yorondesa Macrina nurtured a multitude of nuns with the hesychistic tradition as the monastic ideal. In addition, with her sacrificial goodwill, she offered her nuns as missionaries and vigilantly followed the struggles and progress of the newly established monasteries with her guidance and fervent prayers. In 1992, despite all her health problems, she traveled to Pennsylvania to visit the ever-memorable Yorondesa Taxiarchia, who lived from 1938 to 1994, and to strengthen that first monastic sisterhood. Yorondesa Taxiarchia was a very blessed and virtuous nun, endowed by God with many gifts, which she cultivated with genuine spiritual struggle, and she was thus able to benefit many people. She fought the good fight and is lovingly remembered as a holy Yorondesa, setting the example of perfect obedience, patience in struggles, and self-sacrifice, fruit which grew from her true love toward God and her neighbor. During her flight over the Atlantic, Inspired with awe by the vast sky and ocean, Yorondesa Macrina was captivated by the theoria of God's great compassion. Quote, Just as the ocean and the sky have no end, so much more is the compassion of God unending. As God's compassion is unending, even so must man's patient, patience be without end. end quote. In America, she experienced firsthand the struggle to spread the Orthodox monastic tradition, and her soul rejoiced seeing even young children learning to say the prayer. 10. The Blessed End When the seven years after Yorondas' surgery drew to a close, remembering the words of her guardian angel, she began to say that the time of her departure was approaching. In the gatherings of the sisterhood, she related that she had seen the late Yorondas Taxiarchia coming to take her, when asked if Taxiarchia was approaching quickly or slowly, she answered quickly. In another gathering, she related that she saw herself walking accompanied by a youth. As they were walking, they saw a vigil lamp that was flickering and the oil was running out. Yorondasa rushed to add oil and light it, but her companion hindered her, saying that its oil is finishing, informing her that he meant the oil from the vigil lamp of her life. One of Yorondas's lifelong desires was to venerate the holy belt of the Panagia. When she learned that the fathers of the holy monastery of Vatopedi, where this relic is treasured, had brought the holy belt from Manathos to the mainland, she expressed the desire to venerate it. The holy belt arrived at her monastery, where a fitting reception had been prepared in anticipation. With visible emotion, profound reverence, and compunction, Yorondasa took the holy relic in her hands and carried it to the Cathilicon of the monastery, which is dedicated to the Dormition of the Theotokos. She venerated it and said, Now that the holy belt has come, I will depart. Her blessed repose came 15 days later. The week before her departure, one of the older sisters, Sister Ephraimia, while washing Yorondas' feet, heard her say, In a few days these feet will be in the earth. During her last days, she communicated with many acquaintances on the phone and invited them to the monastery, where she bestowed on them her last words of guidance and gave them items from her cell as a blessing. By divine providence, many others came to visit and receive Yorondas' blessing without being informed of her state of health and approaching end. Still others, she contacted herself, expressing her desire to see them without, however, revealing the reason. During this period, she had difficulty breathing due to cardiac insufficiency. At nighttime, when her condition was at its worst, she would see a young girl with braids, about 12 years of age, come out of the icon of the Panagia, quick to hear, that was in her cell. The girl would approach and cover her. As Jerondasa gazed upon the Panagia, her labor breathing subsided, allowing her to fall asleep. Jerondasa had not told anyone about this, nor did she allow any sister to stay in her cell, so as not to lose the heavenly companionship of the Panagia. One night, Sister Ephraimia, worried about Yorondas' labored breathing, quietly slipped onto the couch of her cell. At one point, when Yorondas sat up and saw her, she immediately scolded her and unintentionally revealed to her that due to her presence, 
presence, she was deprived of the visitation of the Panagia that night. The day of Eurondas' repose was the Sunday of the Holy Fathers of the First Ecumenical Council on June 4th, 1995, May 22nd on the old calendar. Hindered by her illness, she did not attend church that day. In the afternoon, although it was difficult for her, she got up to bid farewell to some pilgrims and then went back to her cell. Around 1.30 p.m., a few sisters went by her cell to see her. Eurondisa, sitting in her chair, began to speak about death. She spoke of her synodia in heaven, yet under Yosef the Hezekist, her first spiritual father, and each sister of the monastery who had already fallen asleep, whom she listed by name. After 2 o'clock p.m., Eurondisa went to lie down, but very soon she got up because of her discomfort. Already, Eurondice's lungs were filling with fluid, which could be heard in her breathing. One of the sisters who had medical knowledge took Eurondice's blood pressure and found it extremely high. She gave her some medication and oxygen. During this time, the rest of the sisterhood was informed of her condition. Some began the paraclesis to the Thiltokos, and others ran to help. Eurondice was quiet and was breathing with difficulty. Her face was a deep rose color and she was perspiring profusely. Her blood pressure continued to rise and she asked one of the sisters to call for the monastery's priest, Father Yosef, to come and bless her with the holy lance and the holy relics. Those were her last words. A footnote, the utensil holy lance used uh, representing the spear that pierced Christ's side used to portion the lamb in the service of proscomity. People are frequently healed from health ailments when blessed by this instrument by the priest. To continue, soon her doctor, Dr. Nicholas Balmitsis, arrived and diagnosed acute inflammation of the lungs with indefinable blood pressure. He tried to help with CPR, but the damage to her, the heart was irreversible. In a short while, the electrocardiogram showed that Eurondisa had passed away. She had already given up her holy soul. During these moments, one of the sisters contacted the Reverend Yeronda Ephrem, who was in America, to inform him of Yerondas' condition, and during the conversation, her soul departed in the Lord. When Yeronda heard of her departure, he said with conviction, Yerondisa is ascending in brilliant light to the throne of Christ without hindrance from the toll houses. End of quote. In the cell of our Blessed Mother, the sisters venerated her holy forehead, which was wet with perspiration and fragrant. Quote, she who hath been translated hence hath crossed life's ever-troubled sea and hath sailed into thy haven through faith. Her venerable body remained in the Catholicon of the monastery for three days after the, until the funeral service and burial throughout the reading of the Holy Psalter. Trisagium prayers for the departed were done by the arriving hierarchs, abbots, hero monks, and priests from Manathos and other holy monasteries around Greece. Many abbesses and nuns from different monasteries, as well as a multitude of mourning laypeople who had benefited from her prayers, counsels, and guidance, came to venerate our reverend mother. The divine blessedness of peace was imprinted on the holy countenance of the venerable Eurondisa. She was present in the Holy Spirit among those gathered, giving their souls divine consolation and grace. An abundance of tears streamed quietly from everyone's eyes, springing from feelings of sorrow and joy, mourning and resurrection, which unexplainably alter, al, uh, alternated in their hearts. Truly, throughout the entire 40 days that followed, the sisters quietly lived the spiritual experience of joyful mourning that is spoken of by the Holy Fathers and ascetics of the Church. This spiritual state was a gift from God through the prayers of the Venerable Mother to strengthen and console them. The funeral took place on Tuesday, June 6th, May 24th on the Old Calendar. After the burial, a meal of love was provided for all those attending in memory of our ever-memorable Mother, a multitude of monastics and laypeople flooded the monastery to pay tribute with their honor and love, to bid farewell to their teacher, benefactress, and mother, and to see her off to the heavenly homeland to meet the bridegroom whom she loved. Amin. 10. The Blessed End 
When the seven years after Eurondas' surgery drew to a close, remembering the words of her guardian angel, she began to say that the time of her departure was approaching. In the gatherings of the sisterhood, she related that she had seen the late Eurondas at Taxiarchia coming to take her. When asked if Taxiarchia was approaching quickly or slowly, she answered, quickly. In another gathering, she related that she saw herself walking accompanied by a youth. As they were walking, they saw a vigil lamp that was flickering, and the oil was running out. Eurondasa rushed to add oil and light it, but her companion hindered her, saying that its oil is finishing, informing her that he meant the oil from the vigil lamp of her life. One of Eurondasa's lifelong desires was to venerate the holy belt of the Panagia. When she learned that the fathers of the holy monastery of Vatopedi, where this relic is treasured, had brought the holy belt from Manathos to the mainland, she expressed the desire to venerate it. The holy belt arrived at her monastery, where a fitting reception had been prepared in anticipation. With visible emotion, profound reverence, and compunction, Eurondasa took the holy relic in her hands and carried it to the Cathilicon of the monastery, which is dedicated to the Dormition of the Theotokos. She venerated it and said, Now that the holy belt has come, I will depart. Her blessed repose came 15 days later. The week before her departure, one of the older sisters, Sister Ephraimia, while washing Eurondasa's feet, heard her say, In a few days these feet will be in the earth. During her last days, she communicated with many acquaintances on the phone and invited them to the monastery, where she bestowed on them her last words of guidance and gave them items from her cell as a blessing. By divine providence, many others came to visit and receive Eurondas's blessing without being informed of her state of health and approaching end. Still others, she contacted herself, expressing her desire to see them without, however, revealing the reason. During this period, she had difficulty breathing due to cardiac insufficiency. At nighttime, when her condition was at its worst, she would see a young girl with braids, about 12 years of age, come out of the icon of the Panagia, quick to hear, that was in her cell. The girl would approach and cover her. As Eurondasa gazed upon the Panagia, her labor breathing subsided, allowing her to fall asleep. Eurondasa had not told anyone about this, nor did she allow any sister to stay in her cell, so as not to lose the heavenly companionship of the Panagia. One night, Sister Ephraimia, worried about Eurondas's labored breathing, quietly slipped onto the couch of her cell. At one point, when Eurondas sat up and saw her, she immediately scolded her and unintentionally revealed to her that due to her present presence, she was deprived of the visitation of the Panagia that night. The day of Eurondas's repose was the Sunday of the Holy Fathers of the First Ecumenical Council on June 4th, 1995, May 22nd on the old calendar. Hindered by her illness, she did not attend church that day. In the afternoon, although it was difficult for her, she got up to bid farewell to some pilgrims and then went back to her cell. Around 1.30 p.m., a few sisters went by her cell to see her. Eurondasa, sitting in her chair, began to speak about death. She spoke of her synodia in heaven, yet under Yosef the Hezekist, her first spiritual father, and each sister of the monastery who had already fallen asleep, whom she listed by name. After 2 o'clock p.m., Eurondasa went to lie down, but very soon she got up because of her discomfort. Already, Eurondasa's lungs were filling with fluid, which could be heard in her breathing. One of the sisters who had medical knowledge took Eurondasa's blood pressure and found it extremely high. She gave her some medication and oxygen. During this time, the rest of the sisterhood was informed of her condition. Some began the paraclesis to the Thiltokos, and others ran to help. Eurondasa was quiet and was breathing with difficulty. Her face was a deep rose color, and she was perspiring profusely. Her blood pressure continued to rise, and she asked one of the sisters to call for the monastery's priest, Father Yosif, to come and bless her with the holy lance and the holy relics. Those were her last words. A footnote, the utensil, holy lance, used uh, representing the spear that pierced Christ's side, used to portion the lamb in the service of proscomity. People are frequently healed from health ailments when blessed by this instrument by the priest. 
to continue. Soon her doctor, Dr. Nicholas Balmitsis, arrived and diagnosed acute inflammation of the lungs with indefinable blood pressure. He tried to help with CPR, but the damage to her, the heart, was irreversible. In a short while, the electrocardiogram showed that Yorondasa had passed away. She had already given up her holy soul. During these moments, one of the sisters contacted the Reverend Yeronda Ephrem, who was in America, to inform him of Yorondasa's condition, and during the conversation, her soul departed in the Lord. When Yeronda heard of her departure, he said with conviction, Yerondisa is ascending in brilliant light to the throne of Christ without hindrance from the toll houses. End of quote. In the cell of our Blessed Mother, the sisters venerated her holy forehead, which was wet with perspiration and fragrant. Quote, she who hath been translated hence hath crossed life's ever troubled sea and hath sailed into thy haven through faith. Her venerable body remained in the Cathilicon of the monastery for three days after the, until the funeral service and burial throughout the reading of the Holy Psalter. Trisagian prayers for the departed were done by the arriving hierarchs, abbots, hero monks, and priests from Manathos and other holy monasteries around Greece. Many abbesses and nuns from different monasteries, as well as a multitude of mourning laypeople who had benefited from her prayers, counsels, and guidance, came to venerate our reverend mother. The divine blessedness of peace was imprinted on the holy countenance of the venerable Eurondisa. She was present in the Holy Spirit among those gathered, giving their souls divine consolation and grace. An abundance of tears streamed quietly from everyone's eyes, springing from feelings of sorrow and joy, mourning and resurrection, which unexplainably alter, al, uh, alternated in their hearts. Truly, throughout the entire 40 days that followed, the sisters quietly lived the spiritual experience of joyful mourning that is spoken of by the Holy Fathers and ascetics of the Church. This spiritual state was a gift from God through the prayers of the Venerable Mother to strengthen and console them. The funeral took place on Tuesday, June 6th, May 24th on the Old Calendar. After the burial, a meal of love was provided for all those attending in memory of our ever-memorable Mother. A multitude of monastics and laypeople flooded the monastery to pay tribute with their honor and love, to bid farewell to their teacher, benefactress, and mother, and to see her off to the heavenly homeland to meet the bridegroom whom she loved. Amin. Homily 1. All of the virtues can be found within obedience and humility. Winter 1971. When the monastic does not have precision in his life, in his obedience, in his prayer rule, he makes no progress. For this reason, my children, I repeatedly tell you to do your prayer rule. I did many things without discernment when I was in the world. I harmed my health because I had considerable zeal then, and I did things without a blessing. We were not in a synobium, and we ate whatever we thought was right. We ate only dry, uncooked food, and we did not tell our spiritual father. We wanted to put into practice everything we read in books without informing our spiritual father. Eventually, we became sick with enlargement and swelling of our lymph nodes. Our zeal was without discernment. However, because we are under obedience here in a synobium, that kind of thing cannot happen. When someone walks the royal path, he will not stray to one extreme or the other, unless, of course, he has the blessing of his yeronda. When Yeronda feels that the disciple should be allowed to do what he is asking, then he gives him the blessing to do it. However, when he tells him, you will not do that, then the disciple must not do it. When we pressure Yeronda to give us a blessing to do something, and he gives the blessing reluctantly, we are the ones who suffer. Afterwards, we say to ourselves, how did this happen to me? It happened because Yeronda did not give the blessing with his whole soul. When one is obedient, his soul has humility. I am a human being with physical weaknesses, but I do have some experience and sometimes I may correct you. When I say to you, children, pay attention to your prayers, your prostrations, to what you eat, etc. I say this from personal experience. When we have genuine, perfect obedience, our bodies will not be weakened, 
nor will our souls become sick. When Yeronda or Yorondasa says something, we must answer, may it be blessed. Did what they say seem wrong? No matter if it seemed ambiguous, undiscerning, or unjust, if they said it, that's it. Since they said it, let us answer, may it be blessed. God sees and judges from above. Whether or not it was fair, Yeronda will give an account before God. We are obliged to be obedient. The more precision we have in our life in carrying out with prudence and respect to the instructions that we hear from Yeronda or read in spiritual books, the more God will secure our salvation. We will progress in all of the virtues. When we say, this doesn't matter, or that's not a big deal, or even, well, since she's doing it, then I will do it too, we will spiritually damage ourselves. Just because she does it, will you do it too? She could be in darkness and led astray by the demons. Do we need to follow one who has fallen? Instead, we must hold ourselves up and say, stand aright, stand with fear. We need to be attentive to ourselves so we do not fall in the same way. We must be very careful. Our monastic life has grandeur and abundant grace. No human mind is able to imagine such depth and such height. Of course, this will be felt by someone at the moment when the grace of God visits him, the moment the Lord visits him. But when one is found in temptation, it seems to him there is no salvation, nothing exists. When we look at ourselves and do not look here and there, when we throw out whatever is rotting inside of us and we look to the road that Yeronda, our spiritual father, has opened for us, then we will feel that grandeur. Yeronda and Yorondasa can make mistakes as human beings, but as we have said, you are obliged to be obedient. Within this obedience, you will find the pearl, the precious pearl. You will find heavenly things, all the majesty of life above that has no end and which no human tongue can describe. Obedience contains all of this. All of the virtues can be found within obedience and humility. If one has humility, he has obedience. On the other hand, when someone does not pay attention to details, takes things superficially and strays here and there indifferently, he ends up saying, what does it matter? This is a fall. Later we will say, how did this darkness come over me? How is it that I have no appetite for prayer? And these thoughts are choking me. Why is it that I am fighting this battle? We cannot understand where it is coming from, but it is from disobedience. If, however, we are careful about the promises we made during our tonsure into the angelic schema, we will correct ourselves. We promised Yeronda so many times that we would make a good beginning. Through your prayers, Yeronda, I will make a good beginning. This is a confession we give before angels, archangels, and men. In one moment, however, we forget this good beginning. It flees from our mind, and we do not regard how Yeronda has counseled us, how he has left us orders to fulfill, or how he has told us to carry out God's will. If we gain all the goods of the whole world and harm our precious soul, we have lost everything. Therefore, we must do whatever is in our strength to do. We must not stray from our goal, we must not abandon the vows we made before God, angels, archangels, men, and our spiritual guides. Every time Yeronda comes to the monastery, we should give him life and joy. He should find us armed with spiritual provisions and spiritual gifts so that he may rejoice. When we have that kind of precision, we will see our souls being fed by heavenly mana. When we truly love Christ, we will cling to his neck. We will embrace his feet. If there is something troubling our soul, and as a human being we fall, we should say, Help me, my Christ, strengthen me, enlighten me, bestow upon more faith upon me, more love, grant me prudence, grant me obedience. The soul will seek after these things because it desires salvation. When we see that we are being attacked by a passion, let us immediately cry out, My Christ, help me, strengthen me, this passion is battling me. How long will I embitter you with my disobedience, with this persistent passion, this darkness I have inside of me? Help me. When God sees our pain and tears, he will help us. When we understand that some evil is gaining a victory over us, whether it be anger, curiosity, negligence, gloom, or insensitivity, we must beg and beseech our God. 
We all have our passions and weaknesses. As much as we can, we must cleanse and brighten our minds. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, strengthen us, enlighten us. After all that, won't our Christ listen to us? He will say, my child is praying and beseeching me. The demons are troubling him. I will help him because he is calling on me. Remember when you were hungry, you would call your mother and she would feed you. Now, even though we drown in thoughts, we do not call upon Christ and we are conquered by the passions. We are darkened and yet we think everything is just fine because we are desensitized. When attention and obedience are absent, insensitivity follows. If, however, we examine the book of our soul to see where we sat in God, where we sat in our sister, if we prayed, if we studied, if we had self-reproach, and if we did our prayer rule with precision, inside that book we will only see our own faults. Then we will say, Let me close myself in my cell, kneel down, and call upon God to have mercy on me. How many years will I live? Life is transitory. If we lose the majesty of the monastic life, we will lose it eternally and we will, will weep bitter tears in the next life. When we depart from this life, we will say, Oh, what have we lost? Now we make excuses saying that God is compassionate and he will save us. Our Lord gives us every opportunity to be saved. But if we do not choose to comprehend this, we have only ourselves to blame. If we end up in hell and see the worm that never dies and that tangible darkness, what will we do then? The saints never allowed the memory of hell to leave their minds. When the grace of God comes, a person sees himself in hell, in the grave, in the fire. If the theory of hell lasts for a long time in one's soul, it cannot be endured and it overwhelms one's entire being. This is why God takes it away and brings joy to replace it. This kind of theory brings much humility into one's soul. It brings repentance, and one is able to see himself clearly. When someone becomes satiated with the richness of God, that person does not want to put anything into his mouth. He can remain fasting for days and still feel that his stomach is full. Oh, how Christ descends and sets up his throne in the heart of man, and how he comforts and refreshes the soul. We must be attentive in everything. Let us force ourselves so that we will not heed, not need to give an account to God. In keeping with our vows and our monastic life, we should carry out the will of God according to our strength. Whatever we do must be done with a blessing, even one prostration. If we say, please let me do it, Yorondasa, I am strong, I feel fine, and Yorondasa does not give a blessing, then we should not persist. If we push and push and push, Yorondasa is pressured into saying, well, then do it, do whatever you want. Later, however, you pay the price. While in the beginning you prayed according to your strength and understood your prayers, once you persist in your self-will, you fall to pieces, soul and body. You cannot even articulate one word in prayer. You cannot even say, my God, have mercy. For this reason, be obedient and say, may it be blessed. Be very obedient without contradicting at all. How much I desire to hear, may it be blessed. How much my soul longs for it. I have desired to hear it for so many years. It pleases my heart and I rejoice. May it be blessed, says the nun. She takes a blessing and goes to her work with her head bowed and her hands crossed. Go, my little child, with the blessing of God. She takes the blessing and is at peace, having a knapsack filled with the blessings of Yorondisa. Then one can see how she is helped by the staff of obedience. May it be blessed. She crosses her hands and goes to her chore. She will overcome every obstacle the road might bring, even thorns and thistles. She will pass through everything because she has the staff of obedience. Our thoughts will say, it is difficult. How will I do it? But everything will become easy and light as a feather when we take this staff of obedience along with us and go forward. We are soldiers of Christ. Today, the general wants his soldiers to go to the borders, tomorrow to the city, the day after, tomorrow to the market. No one will say why, but instead, may it be blessed. This is submission. This is spirituality. This is monasticism. This is salvation. 
blind obedience, silence, prayer, humility, and self-control. In our words, our behavior, our movements, and everything are the joy and exaltation of the monastics. From which university does the nun graduate? Every year, every month, our joy is to pass from one degree to the next. We should say, today we will cut off this passion, and the next day, my Christ, I am trying with all my strength to cut off another passion. This is our university at which we obtain degrees and medals from our Christ. If we want to go to Christ, we need to give great attention to the matter of our salvation. We must try not to have self-will, which crushes a person's soul. Let us be careful not to be offended by one another. We must do what is right. If one can just imagine what beauty we have in the monastic life, but our passions and our weaknesses do not allow us to enjoy it. How did the saints do it? They would get up in the night and wash the clothes of the sick. They would serve the poor. Why? How? They had divine eros. How should we be in our monastery? Our hearts should fly and we should not grumble. When we are at our diaconima and someone is in need of help, we should all rush to help that person for the love of Christ. We should all go together with cooperation and eagerness to help the sister who carries the most weight in her work. When I was working in the world and would finish before the other women, I did not feel right to be without work. I would help them in order for us to finish all together. We were content with each other and had mutual harmony, love, and support. When we parted from one another, we would cry. How much more so should this be in the monastery? For the love of Christ, let us go all together to help each other, and let us not be offended by one another. God will see the footsteps of each one of us. We must labor in order to see Christ. We must force ourselves until we have an illness. However, when someone is able to offer help, but looks out for herself and does not do it, then she will not enjoy the reward. There is a saying, as you make your bed, so you must lie on it. Did a sister work hard? then she will be rewarded greatly. Back when I was working in the world, I would say the prayer and would not speak, and because of this, I was benefited both in soul and body. When someone struggles to do what is right, God will not abandon him. He fills his treasure chest with money. He fills it with virtues, and the other person will be loaded with these as he ascends to heaven. One does not do this for Yerondesa or for Yeronda, but for the Panagia. If the nun keeps this in mind, then she will not simply have eagerness and zeal, but she will have so much joy that she will want to scrub the entire monastery on her knees. We should be very orderly in the monastery. For all of this, the nun will be rewarded by the Panagia. She will receive grace within her soul, especially when she does everything with humility. She will reproach herself, saying, I do nothing, but God gives me strength to do it. We will not see all of this reward here. We will see it in heaven. When a person says the prayer, he cannot show off, shout, or talk. The grace of God makes him meek and humble. It is impossible for God not to soften his heart. When he says the prayer, how much sweetness he feels. Idle talk, grumbling, and discussions interrupt any communication with God and bring agitation. One sister does not hold back and says her thought to another. Now burdened with this thought, the other spreads the evil. Afterwards, she's unable to pray, do her spiritual duties, enjoy her cell, or find rest anywhere. There is need for humility in our souls. Through humility, we will be saved, and God will bestow on us abundant grace. Through saying the prayer, a person feels divine consolation and heavenly grandeur. There is spiritual fragrance in our monastery. There is struggle and preparation for the heavenly things. The soul fears nothing when it goes to its work with joy and does not contradict. May it be blessed and forgive me. What spiritual bliss? A person is free. Paradise. In spiritual theory, we see earthly things as heavenly. But when we grumble and talk idly, God leaves and we occupy ourselves with the faults of others. On the other hand, when the sister thinks about how she will delight in her bridegroom, how he will adorn her, and what he will bestow upon her, she feels like a small child. 
Oh, what gifts God will grant to her. He will say, Open your embrace, hold out your little apron and take them. They are all yours. I am giving them to you. Do you want sweetness? I will give it to you. Do you want transformation? I will give you theoria, blessedness, divine flame, and so much spiritual delight that you will not even be able to stand on your feet. Oh, how beautiful life is in the monastery. You will say, my God, grant me years to work for you. Give me wings that I may fly to you. Our laziness, however, and asking, why should I have to do it? makes everything seem burdensome for us. In toil, a person finds God. The grace of God is full of majesty. Homily 2. A disciple feels great joy and delight when laboring spiritually. December 12, 1978. One can noetically communicate with Yeronda and Yerondasa when one has obedience, faith, and love towards them. The disciple feels the unity once, when I was concentrating and entreating God for all of you, Yeronda came to my mind, and I saw him as if in real life. He was so alive as if he wanted to speak to me. I saw him young as he looks in the picture where he is a deacon. He sat on my green stool, and I was feeling the blessedness that I felt on the veranda when Yeronda would counsel us. I saw him so vividly as if he were sitting next to me, but he was young. I felt such spiritual union, just like back then. I am thinking that he must have been praying a lot for me then. I remembered the years that have passed. It does not matter if Yerunda is close or far away. It is enough to have spiritual unity. Just like when I feel a person pulling on my veil, and that person, even though she is far away, feels my veil in her hand, so it is when someone has spiritual unity with Yerunda and Yerondisa. The disciple feels that mutual union and the peace that comes from it. A disciple feels great joy and delight when laboring spiritually to please Christ and to please Yeronda or Yerondisa. He does not fear death. He awaits it. We must be attentive to our thoughts so that there is no trace of criticizing Yeronda or Yerondisa. When we keep hold of this, we will see miracles. Homily 3 for one disobedience, Adam and Eve were exiled from paradise. March 28, 1979 Through Yeronda's prayers, we will speak about spiritual obedience. As Yeronda has counseled us many times, spiritual obedience is something very important. We would sit out on the veranda, and he would counsel us so beautifully. He would tell us that when a person has spiritual obedience, he also has many spiritual states. In this way, the disciple is united with his Yeronda, and he understands what Yeronda wants him to do. What does he want? Is he seeking prayer? Pray. Does he want silence? Be silent. Does he want prostrations? Do prostrations. What does he ask from us? He wants us to have mutual understanding and to struggle. You observe the soul becoming one with Yeronda and Yerondasa, and it becomes like an iron, which when plugged in, immediately heats up and you begin to use it. This is also what happens with blind obedience. We receive this grace when we do not judge Yeronda or Yerondisa. You should plant this deep inside your hearts and pay close attention to it. I will not say much, but if you do this even for one month, you will see what spiritual unity you will gain and what joy you will have within you, what exaltation, what delight. Whatever Yeronda or Yerondisa might say or do to you, may it be blessed. By saying, may it be blessed, strength comes to the soul and it begins to fly. For one disobedience, Adam and Eve were exiled from paradise. What was different about that tree? It was nothing special. There was nothing evil about it. God simply told them, you will not eat of this. They disobeyed and as we know the story, they were deprived of paradise. For this reason, today we suffer misery and are being dragged around because of sin. First of all, everything needs to happen with a blessing. This is why the Holy Fathers said that in their times, everything, even the very breath of a disciple, was known to his Yeronda. Even when they wanted to drink water, they asked for a blessing. So likewise, we should be diligent in our spiritual obedience. When our thought tells us, oh, it doesn't matter, it's nothing, this is a burden we will carry. 
Did Yeranda say it? Did Yerondasa say it? That's it. When one realizes this, then he feels grandeur in his soul. His conscience is so at rest that from his great contentment he says, Take me now, my Christ. Because his soul is ready and he is at rest, he seeks every way to glorify the name of God. One time when we were sitting on the veranda and it was very late at night, Yeranda said to his sister, Go and walk all the way to the cemetery. May it be blessed, she said. Bless me, Yeranda. He made the sign of the cross over her, and she started out, and walking all the way to the chestnut trees, before Yeranda called out, Come back! He did this to see if the sister had faith and obedience. For when a person has faith and love for God, he is not afraid, since perfect love casteth out fear. 1 John 4, 18 Night is turned into day. This is how Papu Yosif and Yeranda Ephraim went out at night in the desert to do their prayers and experienced the majesty of God. Prayer is the greatest gift of God, and when God's love overcomes a person, then when he prays he feels like he is being cleansed. He is not bored. He is not lazy. Of course, his thoughts will fight against him. He will battle with despondency and sloth, with the fear of labor and with cowardice. A thought comes and says to him, Go ahead, lay down. But when a person is persistent, all of these thoughts leave because they are from the devil. Then a person begins to pray. He goes into ecstasy and is made worthy to see the majesty of God and enter theorias. When someone has prayer, the All-Holy Spirit works inside his soul and he finds himself in the Holy Spirit. For this reason I beg you, since we came to the monastery and live here in this ark, we should greatly attend to the matter of prayer. When we acquire prayer, it will be a light and a guardian in our soul because God will protect us and will not abandon us. We need to diligently avoid idle talk because idle talk is like a wildfire, as the Holy Fathers say. Just as we have seen entire forests burned down in Pentelee and in Kephisia and their hills left bare, in the same way, idle talk removes every good thing from inside our souls. It distances all that is good from our hearts, and we remain like a rusted tin can. We have seen many people who pray noetically, and we say, What a holy face that person has. What a beautiful thing prayer is. When a person has prayer, he will also have obedience. All of these virtues go together. Within prayer, one can find everything. We speak a little about theoria so we can draw closer to prayer. When we want to approach prayer and we do not have a good disposition, we should immediately put aside everything and start spiritual theoria. From theoria, prayer will begin. Let us say now that we find ourselves in the gospel of the prodigal son. Your own improvised prayers are like theoria, except that you say the words aloud while you collect your noose. Now I am climbing to the neck of my father, my bridegroom. Then as you begin, you see Yeronda and Yerondasa noetically. You make a prostration before them and beseech them to help you advance on the path of God, saying, Pray for me that I may walk this path. You see your soul, through Theoria, clinging to the neck of Christ like the prodigal son. First you kneel and embrace his feet, and then little by little, from embracing his feet, your boldness towards Christ grows, and you end up clinging to his neck. You beg him to forgive you for whatever you have done in your life, for embittering him, for grieving him, for allowing the minutes to be lost and the hours to pass wasted and for sinning so greatly. You see yourself in tatters, without shoes, without garments, the rags hanging off of you. You see how you wasted all those years that have passed without even realizing it, without paying them any regard, without being close to God. You start chanting the hymns imploringly. Make haste to open unto me thy fatherly embrace, for as the prodigal I have wasted my life. And you ponder every word of the hymn. Reflecting on all of this, your soul deplores itself, and gradually you acquaint yourself with Christ, and his love overcomes you. The more Christ sees the soul loving him and beseeching him, and he sees it in rags and in pain like a lost lamb, the more he begins with his love and affection to prepare sandals, to prepare a belt and clean, bright, luminous garments. 
with great warmth and enthusiasm, he gives you the first garment and then another to beautify you from head to toe. Then in your soul you feel that you are being baptized, that you are like a little child and you feel such lightness within as you watch yourself fall at the feet of Christ, holding him in your embrace. You see your garments, bright, beautiful, radiant, and as you see them externally, likewise, you see yourself internally. The soul feels this and cannot restrain itself, and the tears begin to fall. Through Theoria, divine grace overshadows the soul, and you see yourself speaking with Christ and conversing with him. Afterwards, sweetness, delight, and jubilation come over the soul, and you feel so humble, like the dust of the earth, When a soul is humbled, it begins to feel compassion, love, and reverence, and it does not accept judgmental thoughts. In perceiving this great affection, this great love of Christ, you overlook whatever fault you see in another, saying, Oh, but Christ has shown me such love, so much affection. He clothed me. He held me in his embrace. How can I show myself ungrateful? You are washed with tears, and the noose is cleansed. You are unable to insult anyone or even to speak inappropriately. As with a filthy object when scrubbed with a brush in soapy water, you will see yourself shining from joy and lightness. How then can tears and blessedness not overcome a person when pondering such lofty thoughts? When someone tastes all of this, he will always have attentiveness, and attentiveness will bring prayer. For example, I might be careful not to talk idly, not to grumble, yet it is human nature to fall. However, we need to immediately recognize our fall. In other words, did we sat in Christ? Let us say, forgive me. Did a sister grieve us? Immediately, we should say, forgive me. Let us make a prostration before Christ and before our neighbor. Afterwards, we will proceed to other theorias until our soul is filled with delight. This is why the saints prayed until daybreak. This is how they reached such heights. They did not take sleep or rest into account like us who enjoy sleep and other good things. After this kind of spiritual work, a person finds so much joy, so much inner delight. Then Christ takes hold of him and says to him, Come, my little child, come, my golden one, so that I may show you the beauty of paradise, those things that I have created while you were absent, when you were far away from your father's house, from your palace. Come now and I will take you there. He then takes your little hand and he shows you, all of creation, what he has made, what he has created in the time of your absence when you were wandering about as a prodigal, living in sin here and there. He takes you by the hand with such tenderness, with so much love, with such fatherly affection, and he shows you saying, here is our garden, there is our dwelling. What beauty, what splendor. After reflecting on all of this, you realize it is not the same to wander around aimlessly as it is to be in the beauty of paradise. When we were in the world, we would occupy ourselves with these theorias. We would gather together and Sophia would start the, 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 the sweet, the tatli. She would say parables from the gospel and from there theoria would begin. Therefore, as much as you can, this is how you should begin your prayer so that you have a desire for it. Think about where Christ went and what he did. Where was he? He was in Bethany where Martha and Maria lived, who loved him so greatly. Their brother got sick and they informed Jesus, their teacher. Then they waited with anxiety, with tears, with pain for the master Christ to raise up their brother. So it is now for us who are awaiting the resurrection of our souls, We say with pain, my Christ, resurrect our hearts just as you resurrected Lazarus. In the same way, resurrect our own souls. The Holy Fathers had Theoria at every place of veneration they visited in the Holy Land. With tears they would arise after venerating each holy site. All of this is a matter of faith and prayer. When you are sweetened by prayer, you will not desire anything else. Time will not suffice for you to run like a thirsty deer and quench your thirst. You will think that your prayer is lasting only 30 minutes and it has really been three hours. God will see this unity and this divine theoria will replace the prayers owed on our prayer rope. Christ will not count how many prayer ropes we do when we are in this state. 
This is the way we will begin. Later, when a person advances in prayer, he feels within himself spiritual states that no one can even imagine. It is like someone progressing into unending light. This is what he sees happening within himself. These things happen through perfect obedience and humility. They happen when someone has precision and he does not say, oh, well, it's nothing, it doesn't matter. Then he sees the grace of God and approaches God saying, I have such a father, such a bridegroom. How can I not draw closer to him? How can I not love him? In other words, it is so difficult for us to love Christ. No, it is so easy for us to reach him. Many people grab him with their hand like this within reach. Here, Yorondasa made a gesture with your hand as if grasping something close by. Because they have such great faith, they say, now I will go and speak to him. I will tell him about my pain and open my soul to him, just as I would speak to another person. I will speak with such conviction that he will grant my request. I will not go with <clears throat> indifference or with any doubts that he will do this for me. I will say, do this for me, my Christ, and whether I want it or not, take me to paradise. We must not be lukewarm. Those who are lukewarm, Christ will spew out of his mouth. It is a matter of faith. There was a man who was deprived of divine grace for 30 years, but he did not despair. He put his hope in Christ and would say, my Christ better late than never. Because Christ does not lie, he is not like us. As perfect God, he is all love, all affection, all joy and peace. Seeing us knocking persistently on the door with much love and forbearance, Christ will open to us. When we go to a house and ring the doorbell, if they do not open to us, then we ring again and again, waiting because they may be somewhere inside. In the end, they come and open to us. If we had left, we would have missed out. Let us persistently knock on the door and the Lord will open to us because he loves us. He loves us so much. We have a father who is all affection, all love. We have guides with so much faith and love. God has made us worthy to fall into such hands. Therefore, let us struggle. We lead a beautiful angelic life. One must only devote himself to watchfulness. He needs to place his thoughts beautifully in order, in other words, with reason and good sense. He should say, I must become last of all so that I can be saved. Whoever goes to the front, Christ takes to the back, and whoever is in the back, Christ will bring to the front. Let us struggle so that we may enjoy the beauty of paradise with its precious flowers that are all even in height and its pleasant breezes that refreshes, enlivens, and brings so much delight. The monastic can enjoy all of this if he struggles. Every task that we begin is difficult. We will labor a little now, but later we will rejoice in the eternal good things. If we do not labor, we will not find Christ. Homily 4. Oh, how wonderful it is for one to live in an earthly paradise. May 1979. If one can only imagine what beauty, what splendor we have in the monastery, how should we feel in the monastery? Our hearts should fly. They should fly. We should not complain and we must not be offended by one another. We must serve all for the love of Christ. We will toil hard in order to see Christ. Why would the saints get up in the middle of the night and wash the clothing of the sick? Because they have divine eros, they would go around at night to serve the sick and the poor. If we do not labor, we will not find Christ. It takes spiritual forcefulness, except if one is sick and unable. Did someone work overtime, he will receive more. When someone struggles, God will not abandon him. He fills his treasure chest with money. He fills it with virtues. All of this will be taken up with him when he goes to heaven. How beautiful! None of us labors for Yorondasa or for Yeronda. We labor for the Panagia. If we keep in mind that we are doing everything for the Panagia, not only will we have eagerness and zeal, but we will want to scrub the entire monastery on our hands and knees. What joy this gives the Panagia! She rejoices. Order and tidiness. What a beautiful thing! And for all of this, each sister is rewarded by the Panagia and receives so much grace. When she does everything with humility, she says, 
I do not do anything of my own, but God gives me strength. It is not my own, it is from God. For every effort we put forth, God will reward us. He leaves no one unrewarded and pays us all generously. However, we do not see this now. We will see it in paradise. If a sister bears more of a burden in her work than others, two or three of us will go to help her so that her soul will, may not become indignant. We must have eagerness to help one another. When a person has the prayer, he does not express himself with shouting, gestures, or grimaces. The grace of God at work in his soul makes him meek, humble, and gentle. However, because we forget to say the prayer, we get angry and argue. When a person has the prayer in his heart, he feels an indescribable sweetness, as if he continually tastes a candy in his mouth. Does idle talk produce this same sweetness? When one says the prayer, he has another sort of nur source of nourishment. He is sustained by something else, the grace of God. This grace departs when we speak idle words. Communication with God is interrupted mainly by grumbling and conversations, and this brings turmoil and anxiety. Once in a while, a sister may get agitated. She tells her thought to another, and the other sister, already trying to put her own thoughts in order, is burdened even more by the thought of the first sister. The evil is planted, and no one is stable. Then there is a rebellion in her soul, and she can neither pray nor fulfill her spiritual obligations. She does not like to be in her cell, nor can she find rest anywhere. Therefore, we need humility in our souls. When we humble ourselves, we will be saved. Through humility, God will bestow on us abundant grace, and through prayer, one receives divine consolation and feels heavenly majesty. St. Simeon, the new theologian, says that a person must feel divine grace here on earth in order to see God in heaven. We have all of the provisions, but we must struggle if we want to delight in God. The monastery has beauty, and the people who come here feel a spiritual fragrance. I do not know if you have felt this beauty inside your hearts. Wherever one turns, he smells fragrance like flowers. When a person has God in his soul and separates the good from the bad, removing what is bad from his soul, then he thinks that there are flowers everywhere. He says, there must be violets and hyacinths here. Are there lilies nearby? Oh, what fragrant basil. When we are spiritually preparing for the Jerusalem on high, the soul feels that the monastery is an earthly paradise. We gather the fruit of our labors, a little here, a little there, struggle, sorrow, patience. And in the end, the soul joyfully departs with a full knapsack. What else do we need? We fear neither death nor thunderbolts or bombs nor anything else because we are ready. My Christ, I have pleased you. Take me now. When one goes to his work joyfully and does not contradict, but says, may it be blessed and forgive me, he feels blessedness. He has no sorrows at all, and he becomes a free person. When people come to the monastery, they say, oh, how beautiful. You have a piece of paradise here. This is exactly how it is. One cannot discern if he is in heaven or on earth because when one has spiritual theory, he sees heaven. God magnifies everything and he makes the noose all light, all joy. The person sees even a flower as something magnificent. God makes his mind so luminous that he says, I am in paradise. He lacks nothing on earth and is not deprived of heaven. Isn't it a beautiful thing for one to live in the monastery like this? There is no higher way of life. You will say, my God, grant me years to labor for you. I have not yet labored for you. I have done nothing for you. Give me years. Give me health. Give me wings that I may fly to you. However, when we are continually grumbling, throwing out words here and there, or idle talking, God departs from our souls. We push the grace of God far away and he leaves. Our inner sloth makes everything heavy and burdensome, and then we cannot find rest, and we can only see the faults of others. Oh, how wonderful it is for one to live in an earthly paradise and to rejoice and delight in it. One is given wings, he rejoices and is jubilant. Believe me, I pray, my God grant me the health I had before when I didn't take account of myself, and I took part in every labor. 
But I think now that if I became involved in everything, I would end up bedridden, and who knows how badly that would torment all of you. I'm not thinking of myself, but I do not want to burden you. If I could, I would fly and do everything. A dove is flying within me. I do not say this to boast. I say it for the glory of God. This is why health is the most precious gift, so that one can participate in every labor and see God. Through labor and hard toil, one finds God. Homily 5. Without the prayer, the heart does not have Christ. June 1979. What a beautiful thing it is for a nun to have genuine obedience. The majesty of the disciple is to do blind obedience and to feel the grace of God in her soul, to acknowledge her mistake and not make excuses. If she does not avoid every distraction, she does not see herself clearly. When a sister begins to question what everyone else is doing, she is straying. She starts criticizing your own disa and the sisterhood, saying, I have more knowledge. What I say is correct, not what Yorondissa says. The monasteries are filling up, but who will be saved? Many are called, but few are chosen, Matthew 20, 16. God does not want cleverness. He wants only for you to worship him and to keep him noetically close by you. God gives spiritual intelligence and discernment to the person who is noetically close to him. Otherwise, we become insensitive and negligent in our spiritual duties and neglect the prayer. Do you have inner turmoil? It is because of disobedience. When a monastic girds himself with obedience, humility, and prayer, he lives a heavenly life. He fears nothing, not even the devil. He only feels a spiritual joy within himself. When one takes hold of obedience, it is as if he were wearing a suit of armor and says, no matter how much the tempter fights me, I will suffer no harm. He is fearless because he has God within himself. However, when he does not have obedience, this creates turmoil for him and for others. When we do things without a blessing, our soul continually falls. For this reason, Yorondasa should know everything, even the breaths we take. If you say the prayer and are obedient, then you will notice even the, the smallest sins, your smallest sins. In the same way, we see the dust in the air when the sun shines its rays inside a house, while without the sun, we do not see it. We should never make excuses for ourselves, saying what we did was right. Let us beseech God to enlighten us so that with a pure noose, we may see our own faults. How much we embitter our angel when we allow today to pass without feeling the honey of grace. I say all this to you because I am your spiritual mother And it is my duty to tell you, and because I do not want us to be separated in the Jerusalem on high, but for all of us to be together. A person who has prayer avoids conversation as much as possible and does not stand around in order to overhear something. He is attentive not to lose God and his communication with him, as St. Simeon, the new theologian, says, When a person has the grace of God, he does not even notice if there are other people around him. On the other hand, without this grace, he finds fault with everything. If one prays and his noose is united with God, he receives so much joy. He does not desire to communicate with anyone else because his heart is flooded with divine grace. He prays as he feels, sometimes with his hands raised up, sometimes like a convict with his hands crossed and his eyes flooded with tears, and sometimes kneeling like he is at the feet of Christ. This comes in a spiritual way, not in one's imagination. Let us strengthen our obedience and our prayer. Faith, piety, and the fear of God accomplish all of this. It is not necessary for us to have worldly knowledge. We should make a prostration to Yorondisa for every misfortune we make, every mistake we make. When she says to us, God forgive you, this is sufficient for us. In this way, divine grace is acquired. Spiritual struggle is needed. Every passion is like a Lernian hydra, the serpent in Greek mythology with nine heads. When someone would cut off one head, another one would immediately grow back in its place. Footnote. To continue. Every passion is like the hydra. You cut one and another springs up. We need to see ourselves clearly. 
What is fighting us? Negligence? Hunt it down. Contradiction? Cut it back. Anger? We must bite our tongue. Did you get angry? Did you contradict? You should reproach yourself. This is how the passions of criticism, jealousy, and egotism leave. Why should you grieve your brother? Did you sadden someone created in the image and likeness of God? Immediately humble yourself. Why should we feel sorry for ourselves? We are dust and ashes. This is the way the fathers battled and conquered their passions. How will mourning, fear of God, humility and tears come into your soul when you ask, what, I have to constantly restrain myself? The saints were tyrants over themselves in order to bridle the passions. If Saint Ephraim never laughed but was always crying, then what can we say? Just as we are continually eating in order to maintain the body, so the soul should constantly be fed with prayer. The one who prays ceaselessly feels divine blessedness and has the help of God. If we had something precious and we lost it, we would turn the world over in order to find it. This is how we must pursue the name of God. Our passions are so alive and so strong that in an instant we lose control of ourselves because we do not pursue prayer. If we were pursuing prayer, it would not be possible for our mouth to let out cold and bitter words. St. Nectario says, A word should come out like honey. A hand should touch the sister like cotton. The grace of God that comes with the sweetest name of Jesus softens the soul. The world could be upside down, yet inside a person there is meekness, self-control, peace, and a spiritual state of great delight. When someone sees himself as a zero and his passions as immense, then he is approaching God. However, if instead he looks around at what others are doing, he is far from God. When a person has divine grace, he does not make gestures and grimaces. When a monastic stands or when he is walking, he should have his hands crossed because a monastic is like one crucified on the cross. We need to bridle ourselves and think about how we will leave this life, which ladder we will ascend, how time is passing, and how we must prepare ourselves well. We must entreat Christ to grant us patience. When we go to our work, we should cross ourselves and say, my Christ, strengthen me that I may pass through this day without grieving you and that I may sing hymns to you. When we are saying the prayer, even if we do not understand it, it is working within us and protects us in temptations. And at the same time, it will help another sister who has a temptation. When we see that a sister is going through a trial, let us say to ourselves, today I won't drink three glasses of water. I will drink one. Or I won't eat two pieces of bread but rather only a half, so that God will help my sister. Seeing us doing this kind of self-restraint for one of our sisters, God grants his mercy to us and to our sister. Let us have humility amongst ourselves. When a passion is really fighting against us, let us say to one of our sisters, My sister, I have this passion. Pray for me a little because I can't fight it. It has worn me down. If we have sisterly love and we occupy ourselves spiritually, praying for a sister who has a temptation, for our sisterhood and for the whole world, we will not have any time to say an idle word. This spiritual occupation will bring us meekness, tears, and so much humility that we won't mind if we are prostrated and humbled before everyone. We must bind our noose, just as the soldiers bind their provision sacks. When the noose tries to leave, we will say, come here. Where do you think you're going? To criticize? To wander about? Sit here, vagabond. But we let our mind go wherever it wants, and when it comes back naked and hungry, how can we place it into our heart afterwards and pray? Even when we are saying spiritual things, this also may sometimes have pride hiding within it. When we force ourselves in prayer, we will have God in our hearts. When we force ourselves and are careful of our behavior, God makes us like a piece of finely woven material, so thin and delicate that it is not possible to hold it. We came here for the love of Christ and to deprive ourselves a little so that we may receive a reward. Without obedience, we will not be saved. There needs to be obedience, humility, and sincerity. The grace of God is in forgive me and may it be blessed. 
We should not do our own will at all. Our will should be that of Yorondisa. Even if it seems like a mistake, since Yeronda or Yorondisa said it, let us answer, may it be blessed. May God help us repent for our sins with compunction and contrition. This will happen when we pray and beseech Christ to enlighten us so that we understand our mistakes. He who continually thinks about heavenly things has great joy and delight and tastes God. When he does not think about these things, he is pulled by earthly things that do not have any value. We should have blind obedience. A command should not have to be repeated. The why and the I want are the two great sins that can separate you from God. In order to conquer this, we must force our physical nature. This is what the fathers did by leaving their self-will behind and saying, through the prayers of my Yeronda, and they received spiritual grace. When we ask why, we put a wall in front of our soul and the sun cannot shine through. When one practices the prayer, he sees spiritual theorias in his soul like revelations. God reveals to the soul what it will gain in heaven compared to what it loses here on earth. In sorrows, pain, and trials, God will reveal paradise to the prayerful soul, and the soul will see itself kneeling before God's royal throne. Then, while standing before the resplendence of the angels, the many-eyed cherubim, the six-winged seraphim, one experiences either the voice of judgment saying, I do not know you, or he feels the love of God, and he hears his voice saying, Behold what I have prepared for you. If a day goes by and one does not feel God's presence, the day is wasted. Everything else, else is worthless. The day should not pass in grumbling, which makes a person dissatisfied and harms the soul. A day should not escape us without spiritual communication with God, because this communication makes one holy, a God by grace. You should pursue the prayer fervently like those who search for a pearl. Without the prayer, the heart does not have Christ. Homily 6. Prayer will take away all of our weaknesses and all of our passions. The Feast of the Ascension, 1980. When we do not have our minds on God, but instead we ask, why this or why that, then we blame others. However, we ourselves are at fault and no one else. We are not in a good spiritual condition, and this is the cause. Whoever pursues the prayer as if it were gold and makes use of every minute, is able to leap over all obstacles, accepting and enduring everything. Then God and the Panagia protect this person. He will be careful not to judge, not to be disobedient, or do things without a blessing. Humility is needed. When one looks to himself, he will see everything around him with a good eye. When a person has God within his soul, he does not speak ill of anyone, and when he sees someone who is suffering, he feels pain, weeps with him, and entreats God to be merciful to him. Through prayer, we will heal our brother's wound and overcome every difficult situation. When a person understands that he is a zero, he neither gets angry, nor speaks unkindly, nor argues, but instead he prays for others. When someone is in the monastery and struggles in trying to cast off his passions, he sees God within his soul, and he continually feels that he is living in a corner of paradise. Say the name of God without ceasing, and you will see how God will protect us. We should not idly talk. Whatever is not related to our job is idle talk. Let us pursue the prayer persistently, just like someone who hunts for a diamond. This prayer will teach us to love Christ. If we are attentive and we remember that for one idle word we will give an account to God, we will not speak idly. Then we will see our own weaknesses and imperfections and will say, the others are all angels and I am nothing. This is how the fear of God comes. The prayer needs to be heard to benefit those who come to the monastery as well. When we see another sister talking, let us not stand near in order to listen to her, but let us say the prayer. A person who does not concentrate on his work and on prayer feels slothfulness and discontented. When the noose is idle, then the hands will remain idle. We do our handiwork for God and not for any person. We will receive the glory from God. Did we see something out of place? Let us put it in its place and not wait for someone else to do it. When we refrain from idle talk throughout the day, we will enjoy the benefit of prayer at night. 
When we have patience and diligence in the prayer, we will take delight in it. When we give our love to Christ, He will give us all His love in return. Prayer will take away all of our weaknesses and all of our passions. When we repent immediately and weep, Christ will immediately come near to us, and we will think that we are in a beautiful garden and not in the monastery. When a person has prayer, he becomes like an angel. Christ takes everything away, all the grumbling, the self-will, and the why depart. When we labor, we will enjoy the benefits. Unfortunately, the day passes with too much talking, and we stray away from the path. We forget the one who will help us and sweeten us. The hour is coming for our departure, and we have no works to present before Christ. Nothing. When a person has his noose on God and on paradise, not on earthly things, and worships the master Christ, then temptations and thoughts are put aside, and he receives joy, delight, and patience. We will have a struggle until we die, because the passions are kneaded in with our blood and must be removed. When a person continually has his noose on God, he says, Why should I converse with others and not have the name of God on my lips? Why should I judge and not have my mind on God? When a person pursues God and the prayer, he does not enjoy words and discussions. Then the grace of God and blessedness overshadows him, and it is as if he does not hear the talking and commotion around him, but feels he is in an, another place. When we pursue the prayer, Christ takes us by the hand and tells us how we should walk, how we should eat, how we should sit. When someone does not believe his thoughts and humbles himself, he has peace and serenity in his soul. The passions will not cease fighting us, but we must fight against them. All of the saints and angels love us and guard us all day long, but we do not love them as we should, nor do we beseech them as we should. Let us have our mind on God and on Yeronda. Homily 7. We should not speak harshly, for harshness impedes the grace of God. September 1980. Courtesy is something majestic in a person, and especially in a spiritual person. We should not speak harshly, for harshness impedes the grace of God. Let us make use of our time, for we will long to have these moments back, but we will not find them again. We must say the prayer unceasingly so that we may feel the sweetness of divine grace. Let us not have conversations that make our days pass wasted. Now, especially as we are communing regularly, we must be very careful. We should say, my Christ, tomorrow I will receive you inside of me. Am I worthy? We should approach with humility and contrition. When the priest says, let us attend, the holy gifts are for the holy this means that in order for someone to commune, he should be holy. If we have something against one of our sisters, or if we do not have compunction and preparation, it is better for us not to commune. What benefit is it to us if we partake of Christ, but we are not mindful afterward to hold him within us and feel divine grace? Let us be diligent in our obedience, because a disciple without obedience is like an unfenced vineyard where the demons go freely in and out. Without this obedience, there is no salvation. Homily 8. Prayer Requires Earnest Pursuit. October 1980. God wants nothing else from us except for the spiritual preparation of each day. Prayer requires earnest pursuit. If we do this, even when we fall, we will immediately realize our mistake and we will repent. Strive to not stain the scroll where your deeds are recorded. Let us say, the evening has come, the day is wrapped up. Has any virtue been wrapped up with it? We must prepare ourselves for the Jerusalem on high. We should make use of our time now, otherwise we will regret wasting our days since we do not know what is in the future and what will come to pass. Let us keep silence as much as possible. Whoever says the prayer more will have more joy. Now that we have divine liturgy every day, the church is full of angels. Every sister has her angel. Some angels are joyful and some are sorrowful. The ones that are joyful are flying and the sister can sense fragrance and blessedness. The others who weep are saying, where is the soul under my care? Why is her noose daydreaming in the world? 
We should please our angels because they guard us and protect us from falling and harming our souls. Let us pray as, and as much as possible avoid talking because there is egotism and idle talk in conversations. For us, the prayer suits us better. We should cling to the neck of Christ and Yeronda, and we should remember that through Yeronda's prayers, Christ will free us from all the passions. We should be careful not to grieve Christ by doing things without a blessing. The more we please the unblemished eye of God, so much more will divine grace operate in our souls. The disciple is free from responsibility. He takes Yerunda's blessing and he has joy and delights in seeing God. Do not make excuses for yourselves when Yerundasa reproaches you because this is egotism, even if you are right. When we accept the reproach, then we see God in our soul. However, when we start asking, why, how did Yerundasa say that to me? She has no discernment. Then divine grace abandons us. When we have humility, God will make his dwelling within us. We will be at rest, and wherever we are, we will see everything as heavenly. Spiritual forcefulness is necessary in the prayer, in our spiritual duties, and in keeping the will of God. No one is saved without toil. Whatever we do, we do for the Panagia, and nothing passes unnoticed. Homily 9. I beg Christ to make you all worthy to embrace his feet. January 6, 1981. We must take the matter of our salvation very seriously. We are nuns, and the most important thing for us is to be obedient. We left the world, and from the moment we entered the monastery, we acquired a Yeronda and a Yerondisa. We must be obedient because whatever they say to us is for our salvation. Do not look to see if the spout is rusted or dirty, but look only to see if the water is clean. When you do your own will, I am very grieved. If I am so grieved, how much more so is Christ? Yeranda prays very much for us. He continually says that he prays for us with tears. It is no small thing that Yeronda prays for us. If we attend to obedience, God will grant us many things through his prayers. If, however, we are disobedient, what account will we give to God? The devil certainly will fight against us. We all have passions. I am not saying that we have dispassion, but we should not play games with the devil. Concentrate on the prayer in your cell, and you will see how the temptations go away. Let us continually remember that Yeronda bears us on his shoulders in order to carry us over the thorns and thistles that block our path, and with his prayers, divine grace will help us. The power of Christ is immeasurably greater than the power of the devil. When we ceaselessly say the prayer and we believe that through Yeronda's prayers we will be saved, the evil one immediately departs. I love all of you the same, and if you opened my heart, you would find the image of each one of you imprinted inside me. You all pass in front of me every day like a film strip, just as we feel pain no matter which part of our body is suffering. I likewise feel pain for each one of you, and I beg Christ to make you all worthy to embrace his feet and to become angels and archangels and many-eyed cherubim to glorify him. I want to lovingly help you find your salvation, but if sometimes I embitter you, forgive me. I do everything in order to help you be saved, not out of spite. Homily 10. God will not allow anyone who calls upon his name to despair. January 1981. You should not get angry when you are scolded, nor should you love to be praised, but rather desire to be humbled. No one else is to blame. Only we ourselves are at fault. We should always throw the weight on ourselves, not on others, because criticism is egotism and pride. If they ignore you a little, or if they scold you, you get angry and have thoughts. Your Yorondasa knows how and when to help you. Do not desire to do your own will, but say as Christ said, not as I will, but as thou wilt, let thy will be done. We are not alone. Look how many saints we have close to us. They come as soon as we call on them, but we do not call on them, and that is why we feel loneliness. Do not depend on me. I am a monstrosity, a dead worm, full of passions and weaknesses. You must cling to the neck of Christ and take him by the hand so that he will console you. This is where you should lay all of your burden, 
because if you rely entirely on me, you will see that sometimes I may make a mistake and you will be scandalized and despair. Well, if you rely on Christ, you will find consolation and what you will feel will be revealed to Yerunda and Yerundasa and they will feel it. You should desire to be rebuked and disregarded so that Christ will love you. The more we call on Christ, the more he approaches us and gives us grace. When one continually calls out the name of Christ, he is able to discern when he is in danger, when he saddens Christ, when he sees even the smallest blemish on his soul. Let us fervently entreat Christ to grant us enlightenment and discernment to understand what pleases him and to accomplish it. When we have watchfulness and prayer, Christ will give us everything. Let us be meek in our conversations and in the way we walk. We should speak with humility, just as the dew on the grass is shaken off when we walk through it. Likewise, divine grace departs because of our carelessness. Much attention and silence are needed. Just as we plug the iron into the outlet and it warms up, in the same way we feel our union with Yeronda. God will not let anyone who calls upon his name to despair. Therefore, let us have forcefulness with the prayer. Whatever our daikonima may be, we should not do it with slothfulness and negligence, but with eagerness and diligence. Then a person is full of joy. He receives heavenly strength and he walks to, wants to work, to labor for God without taking himself into account. Christ will reward us according to our thoughts, according to how we think. For this reason, we need to have self-denial. When we begin any task, we should think that God is watching us and that our guardian angel is with us. Therefore, anything we do should be done with piety and faith, and then every endeavor will have the blessing of God. When we continually see ourselves in Hades, we do not occupy ourselves with anything worldly. We will say to our noose, come here. What business do you have wandering here and there? We should take our soul by the hand and take it for a walk. Come, let me take you to paradise to taste its splendor. I will take you to the throne of God to delight in your bridegroom. Come, I will also take you to Hades. Do not allow your noose to wander right and left all day long like a vagabond. Afterwards, the soul is exhausted and it comes back tired and dirty. How will it have a desire for prayer at night? We will want only to eat and sleep. After this, how will the soul behold the magnificence of God and delight in him? We must have control over our soul in order to be saved. We are not saved with discussions and grumbling. We give way to the evil one, and he throws us over his shoulder, dragging us along all day long. Try saying the name of God all day. Call on him, weep, and you will see how your thoughts disperse. God will ask us how we lived as his brides. Does an angel get angry? Does he laugh? Does he talk idly? An angel is next to the throne of God and worships him all day. How much fear of God and love we must have in our soul. If someone has love within himself and sees another in a fallen state, he weeps and says, This image and likeness of God is so fallen, so far from you, my sweetest Christ. Unfortunately, instead of obeying your own desire, we obey our thoughts and do things without a blessing. The angels are recording these actions, and so are the demons. We lack attentiveness. We are careless and disorderly. Let us keep our noose on paradise, on the prayer, and on Yeronda. When a disciple has divine grace and humbles himself, he does not see errors or mistakes in Yeronda or Yerondisa or even in the brotherhood. But when he has egotism, he is always making excuses for himself, and it seems to him that everyone else has passions. He says, Yeronda did not do that well. This other thing is not correct, and so on. When a person says the prayer, everything inside him is put in order, and he has peace. Many times we do not pray throughout the day, and listlessness and negligence conquer us so that we are reduced to thorn and tattered rags with no inclination to do anything. Prayer does not mean doing your rule on your prayer rope hastily, with your mind wandering. Prayer means saying words to Christ, beseeching him to help you be saved. Then you feel Christ responding to you and speaking to you very sweetly with such tenderness, just as a father speaks to his child. We are deprived of all of this because we leave our noose without spiritual occupation during the day. When I see a sister who is not in a good state, 
I pray for her that God will help her to realize her mistake. Then God begins to speak inside of her since my prayers were said with great pain. Yorondisa has a tremendous amount of responsibility for every soul. If, however, the sister ignores her own conscience and is not aware of her state, then God begins his discipline with some difficult trial or with an illness in order to bring her to repentance and save her. When you are in difficulties, I say to him, My Christ, find a way for this soul to recover so that I won't see her being tormented in Hades. When I see idle talk and contradiction, I say, Something is absent inside them. God is absent because they do not have prayer. But when I hear, forgive me and may it be blessed, then I say, my Christ, make her worthy to delight in you. Thus, divine grace comes to you through obedience. But as soon as contradiction starts, divine grace withdraws and Christ leaves. We must believe that we are nothing. Only in this way will divine grace overshadow us. When we see something out of place, we should take care of it and not say that something else will pass by and do it. This indifference of ours is disdainful to the Panagia and Christ because this is their house and everything here should be perfect. I myself cannot pray with my bed unmade or my dresser untidy since during that time I am calling on Christ to come and he will come. How can I receive him if everything is a mess? Homily 11. When a person remembers hell, he never sins. February 25th, 1981. Just think of the worm that never sleeps. Think of the eternal fire. When a person remembers hell, he never sins. It makes the one who is quick to anger become meek. The passions subside and the soul softens. It becomes tender like those little flowers that spring up and have so much freshness. This is how the soul becomes soft like cotton. It aches, it sympathizes, it is compassionate, and it cannot stand before the infinite compassion of God. The compassion of God is like a vast ocean. A soul is able to bear everything else, divine flame, love, and eros, sweetness, etc. All things can be endured, but not this compassion. So great is his compassion. One calls out then, I am not able to bear it. When God's love comes into a man with his sins and passions, he feels pain for the whole world and is not able to endure it. Think how much greater is the compassion of God. The more the world falls into sin, the more it wallows in evil. The infinite compassion of God visits a holy man, and he thinks of the immense ocean of God's love that is endless. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Matthew twenty-two thirty-nine. Think of it. What an awesome thing this love is. A person murders, he fornicates, and yet you love him. We grumble, ah, she didn't speak to me. That other sister ignored me. This one disregarded me. If we knew that we lose every second, we would not be looking either right or left. Instead, all of our being, all of our speech during the entire day would be directed toward God. Then we would say, this minute escaped us. These five minutes escaped us. We've lost a whole hour. But because we are in our own world, we do not see what is beneficial for our soul, and we complain that others ignore us. What a wonderful thing silence is. When someone is silent for even one week, I will not ask more of you, just one week, if you are silent and you have your noose on the unceasing prayer, you will see a great difference in your life. But we are not able to refrain from talking and discussing. We cannot keep from criticizing and from passing judgment on others. We look around at this person or that person, and for this reason, we do not make progress. What majesty God has, let us keep silent without, with ceaseless prayer for one week. I will be silent today. I will count the words I say. How difficult can this be for me? And we will see then how prayer will come, how the tears will flow, and we will seek out a secluded place we will seek to be alone, and we will not be able to endure any noise. Our soul will feel so light. We are able to enjoy all of this, and it is so easy. No one feels difficulty when they have spiritual delight and blessedness. What a beautiful thing. We will be calm and without cares or any problems at all. Our spirit will be in heaven. We will rejoice and taste the grandeur of God.
Homily 12. I desire to see you in heaven as a choir of angels. March 12, 1981. Let us be very attentive to obedience and humility. Yorondisa should not have to say something twice. We should say, bless me and may it be blessed. If she tells us to do something one way now and she later changes her mind, we should say that this is how God enlightened her. If once in a while she corrects us in something, we should accept it even if it seems that she's not right. We should not say, no, I didn't do that. Yorondisa might be testing us. We should say, may it be blessed. Thank you very much, Yorondisa. I do not have words to thank you. Pray for me. I have many passions. I am all passions. I have nothing good inside me. Whatever I say, I say for your own good, not from spite or malice. I do not allow a bad thought about you to stay with me even for a second, because I know that this becomes an obstacle for Christ to come into our souls. If we think that Eurondissa is saying something from spite, we will begin to have thoughts. Then lack of faith and coldness overcome us, and the expression on our face shows that our ego is boiling inside us. We have a lot of egotism and hidden conceit. This is why we cannot handle even one comment and we immediately react. Let us not embitter one another. If at any time something happens, we should make a prostration and say, forgive me, my sister, I am human. I made a mistake. I have many passions, pray for me. This is how divine grace will enter into our soul. We should continually whisper the prayer in order to feel divine grace. No idle talk or conversations. This is the way the devil steals our time and precious time passes with daydreaming and without feeling Christ within us. Here in the monastery, we must feel sweetness. The prayer should be like honey in our mouth. When we wake up, we should feel blessedness, fragrance. But if we do not say the prayer, how will we feel these things? When a small child calls out, I want bread, I am hungry, does his mother not run and prepare him something to eat? Likewise, if all day we call out, we want to be saved, we want to be saved. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Will Christ not send us his mercy? It is impossible for this not to happen. The Panagia protects us night and day, even if we do not see her. In the evening when we are sleeping, she passes from cell to cell and covers us. We must not forget her. We must venerate her. We must kiss her hands. She is the caretaker and champion leader of our monastery, and we are guests in her house. We need to take care of it. We should say, are we worthy to walk on this ground? In the next life, Christ will say to us, what did you do when you stayed in my house? Therefore, let us go to our diaconima on time. When we are continuously saying the prayer at our work, we will be approaching God and we will begin to know ourselves. I want to give you peace of mind as much as possible, to gently help you in my own way so that you can understand with only a gesture from me what you should do. I do not like yelling and disputes, nor do I want to impose myself with a raised voice. I want, however, for you to honor this and to be obedient. I desire to see you in heaven as a choir of angels close to the throne of God. I am a sinner and the worst of all, but I want to help you as much as possible for the love of Christ. Homily 13. Through obedience, the soul will see God. The Sunday of Pentecost, 1981. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are love, joy, peace, faith, meekness, self-control, fear of God, patience, humility, guilelessness, zeal, goodness, self-denial, and divine eros. We should continually ponder these things and examine ourselves to see if we have them. We need to discern what is from God and what is from the devil, and whatever is from the devil we need to avoid and expel from ourselves. Envy, criticism, hatred, and remembrance of wrongs, all of these are from the devil, and we must cast them out. The monastic will be judged in detail. For this reason, we should catch and examine even the smallest things. God wants us to be angels, to live like the many-eyed cherubim and acquire humility and contrition. The Holy Spirit refreshes like a breeze on the, or the morning dew. Sometimes he approaches like a flame and you say, where is this fire coming from? Or like a breath of air and you look around to see from where it originates, but you see nothing. 
these kinds of spiritual experiences occur within the soul. Sometimes you think that you are in the middle of glowing embers, yet you are not burning. This flame consumes your inside and your heart and fills your noose with light, but it does not burn. Instead, it refreshes. When a person is attentive to obedience and humility, Christ freely bestows the grace of the Holy Spirit on him. But he wants us to love him fervently, not falsely. Just as when we love someone very much, we pay careful attention to him, adorn him, and try to protect him. We must also love Christ like this. Christ does not want many things from us. He only wants us to occupy our noose with spiritual things throughout the day, rather than busying ourselves with grumbling and worldly things. We should kneel down at the feet of Christ and embrace them like Mary Magdalene, who from her great reverence, as we see in the icons, covered her hands with her clothing in order to embrace his feet. From there, we should take our soul to the dwellings of the saints in paradise. When temptations surround us, we should cling to Yerondo's neck so that he will carry us over the traps of the devil, keeping us unharmed. When we pass our days in this manner, then we will think that paradise is even here. Our soul becomes like white velvet. The faults of others seem like nothing, and they do not affect us. We feel that we are worse than everyone, and we do not want to hear others saying good things about us, but we would rather be scolded and humbled. If we see another soul in a fallen state, we pray and weep for them out of abundant love. The compassion of God is endless like the ocean, like the heavens. God does not say, why did you fall? But instead, why didn't you get up? He forgives us for everything. It is enough that we repent as soon as we understand we have made a mistake. Are we not human? We fall. However, we must get up. Christ loves us so much. Who loves us? He who created the entire world. He chose us out of the world, and he made us his brides. The brides of Christ must have integrity, obedience, and humility. The earthly bridegroom wants his bride to have nice clothing and shoes. He has his own interests. The heavenly bridegroom wants obedience, humility, reverence, and self-control, not idle talk and contradiction. He wants precision, especially in the matter of obedience. Obedience will bring peace, serenity of soul, goodness, meekness, and the majesty of God. Through obedience, the soul will see God. The monk who has obedience does not feel bound. He is like a free little bird. He feels carefree like the birds, the nightingales, and the swallows which sing and praise God. When a person holds on to obedience and pleases Yeronda and Yerondisa, he pleases God because he is being obedient to God. We must become his true brides and love him. If we love him, we will long for him as we would for someone dear to us. Just as he has greatly loved us, so he asks us to love him entirely. We have also said that Christ is jealous. He wants us to offer our love entirely to him. When our love is true, we will be precisely and orderly in our spiritual duties, in the church services, in our handiwork, and in everything. Homily 14. In this ark to which Christ has brought us, we must become angels. August 1981. Today we begin the fast and the services of paraclesis to our Panagia. Together with fasting, we need to be attentive to keeping silence and constantly whispering the prayer. Fasting from food does not benefit us if at the same time we are criticizing, talking about others, idle talking, and aimlessly wandering here and there. The prayer, silence, and work are the instructions that Yeranda has given us, and we must abide by them. If we are obedient to him, we will be informed by God, and when he comes, he will tell us about paradise and other heavenly things which our noose is not able to comprehend. Let us continually keep our thoughts on spiritual theoria, at times embracing the feet of Christ, and at other times embracing his cross, where his all-holy blood was shed to cleanse us. After Christ, we should go to the Panagia. We should embrace her little feet, look into her sweet eyes, and speak to her noetically. We should have her as a mediator because our prayer has no boldness and we are not worthy to call on the name of Christ. God upholds us as a favor to her and we should beseech her on our knees for the whole world and for ourselves 
so that she will help us and free us from our passions and shortcomings. From the Panagia, we will go to Yerunda. We should fall at his feet and beg him to forgive us. Let us progress from one theoria to the other. If we do not waste even a moment, then neither idle talk will be heard, nor grumbling, nor contradiction. We should say, forgive me and may it be blessed. Whoever humbles himself more and asks forgiveness will find more divine grace. In order for someone to conquer his passions, he must look only at himself and not right or left. We must anticipate the passions and weaknesses that sprout up in our soul because if they grow strong, we will not be able to uproot them easily. Every passion that sprouts up needs to be cut down. Much humility is needed for us to progress in the grandeur of God's love. When we make our noose a heaven and our mouth a church and we are patient, God will number us with the monastics of the end times, whom a saint has said will have greater glory than any monastics from any other age. This is because today there are no virtuous guides as examples and everyone struggles alone as he's able. We need to protect our eyes and our ears and ceaselessly pray in order to have the grace of God. The more we struggle, the more we will set aside spiritual reserves and we will not fear anything no matter what comes. When a person prays, he sees from where the devil is coming to attack him. But when he is careless, negligent and hard-hearted, the demons sneak up on him, creating commotion. Then he is darkened and becomes like the devil. Our noose needs to be vigilant, ceaselessly saying the name of Christ. If someone abandons his prayer and his spiritual duties, he becomes like an irrational animal. The demon of pride and egotism battles all people today. If we do not throw off these passions, we will not see God within us. In the gospel, Christ says that for even one idle word, we will give an account to God. See Matthew twelve thirty six. A saint did not say it. God himself said it. Our carelessness is the reason we do not have divine grace and why everything goes wrong for us. We must remember our guardian angel. When we disdain him with our works, he is saddened, distanced himself from us. But if all day long we keep in mind not to sadden our angel, he will have his wings open and will cover us. When he hears us saying the prayer and he sees that our noose is paying attention to the prayer, he rejoices. Sister Vriani would say, I do not have words to thank my big brother who stands next to me when I work and when I pray and is constantly laboring for me. Shouldn't I also strive not to sadden him? We must be attentive to our thoughts, our mouth, our ears, our five senses. When we are not careful of these, then we think others are at fault. When divine grace comes, repentance and tears follow. Then a person desires to lie down so that everyone can trample on him and he pays no attention to anything around him. When this light comes into our soul, we should embrace it. We then see the dust and the germs in our soul. We must attend to the matter of our salvation and not be superficial about it. Just as the ocean and the sky are endless, so much more endless is the compassion of God. Now he tolerates and puts up with us, but divine justice will come with glory. With fear and trembling, the angel's trumpets will sound. What account will we give then? Every word that comes from Yeronda or Yerondisa is from above, and if anyone does not keep it, then he receives the just recompense. Let us lay aside whispering about others and discussions, and let us do the will of God. Let us feel the compassion of God, who waits for us with his open embrace. I want us to take working with silence and the prayer seriously, so that the smile of divine grace is in our soul. We will see a heavenly world inside our soul, and then we will feel neither sadness nor loneliness. When I take my noose to paradise, I find a multitude of companions. Who will I not find there? Angels, archangels, saints, and martyrs are all there. We are not alone. Christ will be within us when we cultivate the gifts of God in our soul. When joyful morning comes, humility will also appear. And then a person says, Oh, that I had wings as a dove. And at other times he will say, My God, give me years that I may labor for you. We left the world, parents, brothers, and sisters, and we came here into this ark. Noah was obedient to God and endured living together with the animals. 
We who have a corner of paradise in the monastery find it difficult and we are afraid. We are dependent on one thing or another and do not run and abandon everything worldly. We must leave behind whispering, words, and grumbling, which all become obstacles in our souls. And let us love Christ and adore him. When we pursue the name of God, everything evil is burned up. In this ark to which Christ has brought us, we must become angels. We live in a corner of paradise with our church, our food, and our comforts. I wonder in the next life, will we be so well off or will the mercy of God abandon us? Through Yeranda's prayers, may we be made worthy to be found close to the saints and the angels together with the martyrs that we may all rejoice together. Amen. Homily 15. We must pursue the name of God. September 1981. When we ceaselessly pursue the prayer, God will enrich us. Only the prayer cleanses the heart. Because we are full of passions, we should sympathize with one another and be careful of our tongue. The tongue has no bones, but it crushes bones. Footnote, a common Greek proverb, meaning that even though the tongue does not have bones with careless words, it can cause great harm. To continue, if we use it for God, it will be all honey and sweetness. If we say words against each other, it will be all bitterness. The person who is obedient and says the prayer will receive abundant grace and will experience many things. Once I was beseeching Christ because I saw myself with many passions and weaknesses and I was grieved because I am not able to please either God or you. I was saying, how will I be saved? How will we approach you when you ask such precision from us monastics? I cannot reprimand you by yelling and making demands, but I try to help you with my prayers. I was pondering, why is it that divine grace does not come into our souls? What are the obstacles? What is to blame? Afterwards, for two consecutive evenings and one afternoon, I saw the following. The first evening, I saw the sun rising so radiant with abundant light, and a voice within me said that this is how man is illumined with divine grace when he has great spiritual forcefulness and self-denial. What I beheld took away whatever sorrow I had, and I wanted to be alone so that I could savor what I was feeling inside me. The next evening, I saw many walls, and when the sun had risen a little, only a few rays of light passed through between them. Then I heard a voice say to me that this is how it is for the person who does not do the works of God as he should. And again, the next afternoon, I saw both short and tall walls, and I was looking for a place where a little sunlight would shine through. I said, how awesome God is. Despite the fact that we sin and put up obstacles which impede us, still a little light comes and tries to warm us and revive us. And in this way, we have a little consolation from time to time. The sadness left me, and the voice told me not to worry because the sun will rise and disperse all the obstacles. For this reason, let us be careful. Let us help ourselves by using the prayer rope and asking for the light of God to come and illumine our inner being. We must stop the discussions of what we did in the world and chase after God. Then he will take us into his embrace and open wide the doors of paradise for us. However, we must fervently love him with all our soul, all our mind, and all our strength. Mark 12:30. Then you will see what God will bestow on us. I say all of this to you out of great pain because our salvation is essential and we should not take it lightly or consider it a shallow matter. We must add a little fear of God and a little self-denial to our struggle and avoid conversations. We must pursue the name of God. Homily 16. Say the prayer vigorously with faith and divine eros for God. November 1981. We must battle one-on-one -on -one with the devil because he strives to destroy prayer. He wants to distance us from God, and he turns the world upside down wherever he encounters prayer. This is why he brings negligence, sleep, and sluggishness. The sleep that he brings to us in church is a great sin. It is considered adultery. The devil says, So, you say the prayer? You chase after God, do you? I will bring you a thousand thoughts so that you cannot pray. 
Our God, however, protects us and our angel rejoices. This is why some people sense fragrance when they pray, because their guardian angel is close to them. However, when we do not pay attention to him and time passes with indifference, why should he protect us? When we feel that our guardian angel is protecting and guarding us all day long, we will have much prayer and reverence. What an awesome thing it is to be attentive to the guardian of our soul. He will protect us from evil and blasphemous thoughts. When we continually say the prayer, our angel rejoices and senses us. The saints have us in their care. They feel pain and suffer along with us. They constantly run to help us, even if our eyes are closed and we do not see them. In court, we hire lawyers and run to find mediators, even though we know that whatever may happen to us is temporary. But do we labor for any of the saints so that we can make them our mediator on the day of judgment? For this reason, we must say with much piety, holy angels and all the saints intercede for us and venerate their icons. The holy angels cover their faces from the brilliance of the Godhead. They cannot set eyes on God's immense grandeur. As for us, our noose, that vagabond, wanders around all day into every passion, allowing anything to slip inside. Therefore, we should beseech the saints with divine fear because God wants us to be pious. We have to fight with a howling devil who is watching at every moment for an opportunity to drown us. However, the resplendence of God's face permeates all of paradise. Let us think, how many words did I say today? We will count all the idle conversations, grumblings, discussions, and superfluous words when we pursue the name of God. When we chase after the prayer, divine grace protects us. It comes like the dew, which enlivens the grass. Likewise, it soaks into the roots of our heart and revives us. Let us use our tongue to him, God. Let the prayer come out vigorously with faith, with divine eros for God, not listlessly and superficially. When a person says it with attention, he feels the fire of the Godhead and a sweetness. He feels the grace of the Holy Spirit as a delicately woven cloth. What blessings God has prepared for us. We must reflect on the beauty of paradise and be grateful and love him. But our noose is absorbed in earthly things, in laughter, in conversations. When a person's noose is in heaven, he is interested in nothing else. Then he says, Oh, that I had wings as a dove, Psalm 54, 7. And other times he says, Grant me years that I may serve Christ. Here and in paradise, he sees everything as golden. But it takes spiritual forcefulness and a little labor in order to find this pearl, which is all sweetness, light, fire, and refreshment. Joy to the one who compels himself to discover this majesty. May God give us patience and forcefulness to finish our life in such a state. Let us pursue prayer. It will become a precious treasure in our soul. We will acquire heavenly experiences. We will be able to see paradise everywhere. Others will mock us, and we will not speak. May God make us worthy to be found in this state at the hour of our death. Let us beseech our angels, our saints, and our Panagia. Whoever does not struggle in prayer does not have God inside him and is unstable. Let us do everything with the fear of God and abundant love. Homily 17, We Cannot Deceive the Eye of God, Which Sees Everything, December 1981. I will tell you about an elder who had a raven in his cell. The elder would say the prayer, and the raven hearing all day long, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, acquired the habit and started saying it too. One day the window was open and the raven flew out. As it was flying, the elder heard it saying the prayer. At one moment, a hawk lunged at the raven. However, as soon as it heard the raven's voice saying, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, it flew away. The bird did not have any sense at all of the grace of God, but because it was saying the name of God, the hawk was scared to approach and kill it. How much more then will the grace of God guard and sanctify us when we say the prayer? The grace of the Holy Spirit is within us and can be operating in us even if we do not understand it. The prayer is doing its work. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Kyrie Jesu Christe, eleison me. We will say the prayer and at some point God will overshadow us. 
God is the wage giver. He will not leave us in want. Meekness, humility, and divine consolation will come from God, and divine blessedness will arrive and help us. Whatever we might have, whether temptations or weaknesses, it is impossible for the grace of God not to overshadow us, because when one says the name of God, it blesses everything. At the time of our work or whatever else we do, instead of idle talking, instead of discussing, instead of telling stories, instead of talking spiritually, it is best if we say the prayer. Because even in spiritual conversation, there will be a judgmental word, a piece of gossip, a little idle talk, some murmuring, and there will be humorous comments and other such things. When we are in the mood for conversations, when we are overcome by boredom, when we are distressed, we should know that this is because we do not pursue the prayer. Let us chase after it, just as the Holy Fathers and the spiritual people in the world did, and felt the grace of God. On feast days and Sundays, when we have more time, we should take advantage of the time and say the prayer more. Just as we do not forget to eat our food in the morning, at noon, and in the evening, likewise we should be conscious of our spiritual duties. The order, the tipicon of the monastery, has grace. This is why the Fathers gave the tipicon. Every company has its rules, and every business has its timetable. If someone goes to work 10 minutes late, he loses part of his wages. As nuns, shouldn't we have precision and consistency, since we owe much, so much to God, to whom we will give a precise account on the Day of Judgment? God wants us to be exact in everything, and He will ask this from us on the Day of Judgment. Everything good we do is received by God, and all the rest, disobedience and disorder, are received by the devil. At the time we pass through the toll houses, they will show us what sins we committed. Our life will unroll before us like a film strip, and we will see every mistake we made. When a person continuously says the prayer, he communicates with God. God refines him, and he is incapable of expressing himself inappropriately. In the same way that the air is delicate and light, this is how the mind of man is refined. God refines it all his feelings, manners, walk, speech, his entire being. A person takes wing and flies. There is order in his handiwork and in his spiritual duties. When we have union with God, everything will be serene and in order. The name of God operates in our soul in the same manner that fortifying medicines and hearty foods strengthen the body. For this reason, we must attend to these matters and be very obedient to Yerunda. We must have faith in Yerunda, and love him abundantly. He tells us these things for our salvation because he has been through all of this, and therefore we must respect the counsels he gives us. If we plant them very deeply inside our heart and put them into practice, then when Yerunda comes, he will easily be able to give us m many more spiritual words to raise us up higher. We must compel ourselves. If there were a huge catastrophe, or if we were in the middle of a war, what would we do? Would we not be standing on our feet? Forcefulness is needed. We must compel ourselves. Let us prepare spiritually. Let us do the will of God. Let us be obedient to Yerunda. There should be restraint, respect, and love amongst us. Please should go before everything. Please, sister, do this for me if it is blessed, I beseech you. How lovely, how beautiful this is. In this way, we will have the grace of God in our souls. We will be fragrant from grace because of good manners and courtesy. God will ask us to give an account for any inappropriate behavior. We are nuns and we must have good conduct. We must have gentleness in our souls. And we should have respect even for a tiny ant. Those who are sick will say the prayer all day long and God will complete their spiritual duties for them. If God hears the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. He will keep us under his protection. He will guard us and will not let the evil one touch us. You must be very prudent in your behavior, and whatever Yeronda or Yeronda says to you, you should do it. They might test you to see if you have humility, if you can be obedient. Even if you made a mistake and I say, may God forgive you, you can commune. You need to be obedient. If you talk back and say, I am not worthy, etc., you will be disobeying and you will harm your soul. The hater of good puts all his skill and all his mastery to use in order to convince us not to say everything to Yerondasa and not to confess properly to Yeronda. 
If we consent to that thought, darkness will overcome us. A great darkness will enter our soul, and the demons will come back worse than before. See Matthew 12, 45. However, when a sister runs with humility to her spiritual father, she will say, forgive me, I am at fault. My passions, my weaknesses, my blindness, my ego, the disorder and filth in my soul separate me from my God, who has consented to enter into my heart so that I can know him. I want you to forgive me. I am at fault. With my eyes full of pride, full of malice, full of evil, I do not see. My soul is blind, and I continue the same behavior. Forgive me. Evlogison. Then forgiveness relieves the soul, and it begins to make progress. Yeranda was telling us that he had a disciple who talked back to him, and at night when the monk went to pray, he found himself on Golgotha and saw the crucified Christ and Yeranda on his right. The monk was begging Christ to forgive him, and Christ on the cross was looking towards Yeronda, saying, Your Yeronda needs to forgive you because through his prayers you will be saved. Then when the vision ended, he ran to Yeronda and said, Yeronda, forgive me, I saw something very vivid. My salvation is through you. Obedience saves a person. It strengthens and helps him. The entire foundation of our life is humility. You need to say, my dear Yorondisa, it is my fault. I see everything distorted. You need to constantly practice self-reproach. In this way, humility enters into the soul and one sees himself and sees God. In the Jerusalem on high, one will see many things. Now we make excuses saying, it is not my fault, it is her fault. This is what she did. This is how she wronged me. No matter what someone else does to you, you need to forgive them. Where are you going to hide from the all immaculate eye of God? Where? In the ocean? He is there. On the earth? He is there. Wherever you hide, he is there. You cannot deceive the eye of God, which sees everything, our movements, our thoughts, everything. You should know that the grace of God departs because of three things, pride, egotism, and the passions of the flesh. If God grants us something, it is because he wants to grant it to us. We do not know why. It is neither from our labors nor from our toils. He gives us something only because he wants to, but he also takes it back without us realizing it. Then the monstrous demon of egotism manifests itself. In that prideful state of our soul, we consider ourselves above everyone else, and we want all people to be perfect and blameless. Darkness spreads within us and covers up our own passions, and we see only the passions of others. However, when we have humility in our soul, we see only our own weaknesses. This is the foundation for us to see ourselves, even our slightest faults. This is how the grace of God approaches. This is how the humble one lives. He sees his own downfalls and in what spiritual state he is in. And about others, he says, I'm not interested in what they're doing. However, when we see someone else's fault, this is pride and egotism. We must be very careful. The devil has such tricks, puts up such a fight and brings such confusion, like when a typhoon rises. This is exactly how he comes with all his regiments. Fervent prayer, attention and humility are needed. Just as when someone is sweetened by something and cannot bear to lose it, he becomes like a crazy person who is out of his mind. This is exactly what happens to someone whose heart is sweetened by God. We must be careful to accept, hide, and guard with great humility that which God gives to us so that we don't lose it. If we lose it, we will be inconsolable. Therefore, we must be careful, constantly showing humility and leading our soul through theoria from the tangible darkness into the unquenchable fire and from the unquenchable fire to the grinding of the teeth. We should reflect on how we will ascend the toll houses. How will we ascend when the demons are standing right next to us, ready to grab us and throw us down into the abyss? This is what I saw by the grace of God. God reveals these things not because Yeronda or Yeronda is worthy, but because of the burden that they carry, and also to obtain the knowledge to correct themselves and their spiritual children. I saw in a vision that I was in a monastery with an iron door like ours, and there was a small icon. Then I found three gold coins like English pounds. And as I took them, I was saying how nice they were as I played with them in my hand. 
a thought came to me that these were the talents. See Matthew 25, 14 to 30. Then I took the icon in my hand and it grew larger. It grew and became a large icon, which was the throne of God hanging in the air. It was very beautiful and I could not gaze upon it. On one side, there were all the righteous and the saints. On the other was a fiery mouth and underneath it was an abyss. At that moment, hierarchs and priests were passing through to be judged. At the end of their trial before Christ, lions leapt out from the darkness, seizing them and throwing them into the abyss. This scene continued for a long time. From there I saw the demons with bags loaded up on their shoulders, and in the blink of an eye they dumped thousands of souls into that mouth. It was so dreadful. You, you could see how that mouth was filled as they emptied their bags into it. I can see it now as I speak. They would throw their bags over their shoulders again and run to refill them. Once in a while, a bishop or priest would appear to whom the Lord would say gently, go to my right. But I will not forget that terror. All night, I could not find peace. For days, it would not leave my mind. I was bewildered seeing priests, hierarchs, monastics, lay people. The world was in chaos. God showed me this in order to humble me so that I could see my soul. Hades is no small matter. In the blink of an eye, to be thrown into the darkness, into the eternal fire. My soul was in this state for a short while, and my heart was terrified. I could not endure it. The lions kept leaping out from within, snatching them by their feet and throwing them into the abyss. A terrible fear had taken hold of me, and I said to Yeronda, Yeronda, I cannot calm down. Yeronda answered, Yes, my child, God shows us these things to humble us, solely to help us with the responsibility that we carry for so many souls. I am telling you all of this, both for your correction and for my own. Homily 18. We must not allow a single minute to be lost. Winter 1981. Footnote. A little while before Eurondus's departure from the monastery to be treated in a hospital in Athens for diabetes. To continue. While I am gone, say the prayer. Do a prayer rope while crossing yourself and a paraclesis for me, and this will strengthen me. I want silence to prevail. Do not idle talk, converse, and complain. We must say the prayer to find God. We must pursue God and not let a single minute be lost. As much as possible, we need to strive to reach God, because in the future we will seek these days that are passing, but we will not find them again. We should speak with love and kindness. It is a sorrowful matter to be in the monastery and to be deprived of the blessedness and the sweetness of God and his love. We must not be negligent. Let our prayer be uninterrupted so that we may savor it. This prayer will bring rest and divine blessedness to the soul. We should constantly say the prayer, not allowing it to leave our minds. Let us be attentive to how we can please our Panagia. Whenever our guardian angel wakes us, we should begin to pray at that very moment. Let us not allow ourselves any slack. When our thought tells us to sleep a little more, we should not sleep. At night, when we get up to do our prayers, let us write down our sins. Great patience is needed in our life because everyone has their passions and weaknesses. Therefore, let us say a prayer for the salvation of every soul that suffers and does not know how to live correctly. And thus, divine forbearance will come into our soul. We must pursue prayer to correct our passions and weaknesses because prayer brings serenity. We should completely concentrate our thoughts and think of God. Everything else is garbage, and we should throw it out. Let us avoid the devil's traps and look only to ourselves. Where did we set in God? Did we please him? Only then will we make progress without straying from our goal. Humility is essential. Therefore, let us become last of all. Whoever achieves this will go forward. When a person prays, then God will give him strength in his task, and he will not do it with drudgery. We should avoid talking and grumbling. We are fought more by complaining than anything, and believe me, many times I see a whole flock of demons pass in front of me in the blink of an eye. But if the monastery is armed with prayer, they cannot do any evil. They will only stand and look on from afar. 
we must have courage and stand well before God. Let us make our noose an open book and reflect on death, Hades, and paradise. We must grasp with our minds that after our death is God's judgment. In other words, where we will go and where we will stand, either in Hades or in paradise. Dwelling a little on eternal hell entirely stirs us up inside. Just think of the eternal fire, the sleepless worm, and the grinding of teeth. If someone reflects on hell, he cannot hold back his tears. When a person has his mind in hell, his passions subside. His soul becomes tender and soft like cotton, and he feels pain for others, sympathy, and compassion. A person can bear almost anything. He can endure the flame and eros of God, but he is unable to bear the great compassion of God. He burns and melts, saying, It is enough, my God, I cannot endure it anymore. When the love of God enters inside a person, he feels pain for the whole world with its sins and passions, and he is not able to endure that pain. Just think about when the compassion of God comes. Love your neighbor as yourself. Just think. Someone lives in filthy sins and murders, and you still love that person. If we knew what we lose every second, we would not be looking here and there. We would focus on dedicating our entire self to God. Silence. What a great thing it is. If you are silent and you have your noose on ceaseless prayer for one week, you will see a definite difference in your souls. Your souls will feel the majesty of God so deeply that you will seek to be alone and quiet. We can enjoy all of this in our ark. If you compel yourself, you will feel divine blessedness and be peaceful without cares or problems, and your spirit will be in heaven tasting God's majesty. However, when we look around at this person or that person, we cannot make progress. If we do not humble ourselves, we will not be saved.